Good morning. Happy Thursday. It's time for an early edition of Coffee and Crazy Words, though it looks like I'm streaming in the middle of the night because of how dark it is outside due to some overcast stormy weather. I've got coffee. I've got cursey words. We've got some quick bits. And then we're going through this reply brief from Amber Heard's team. My in-ears just want to be the star of the show today. They're gonna, they're just gonna keep popping up. And I got a new mic stand. Hi. I can just, I can I can I can just move it. I it just it just goes with me. It just goes with me. I can't tell you how excited I am about this mic arm look. This is like the fifth mic arm I've had trying to get the ideal setup. Anyone with ADHD feels me. You cannot work until it is perfect. The right pen, the right setup, the right notebook, the right computer background, the right playlist, the right thing to put on in the background, whatever it is, you need the right one. And my mic arms had started pissing me off, especially when I'm streaming trials, which the Murdoch trial is coming up in January. I need to be able to like sit back <laughs> and, and bring my mic with me. So now I can without having to unscrew it and rescrew it and unwind it. I needed it to be more dynamic. Look like a real gaming streamer up in here, even though we don't stream games. I just, I needed it to be right. <laughs> Bex said not ADHD. Um, as far as I know, but very much feeling that. Look, it's true. It just is. So let me know where you're coming in from. Let me know what you're drinking. We're doing some quick bits, some really quick, quick bits. And then we're going to just go through this appellate brief. I have seen that there is a Ben Chu reply to the amicus brief. We haven't done the amicus brief yet. The amicus brief and the Ben Chu brief will get their own show. There's a bunch of Britney Spears updates. They are going to have to get their own show. I am so bummed that we don't have time to get to Britney today. But I have a hard stop meeting that is is just a thing that I cannot miss. So I have a hard stop meeting today and have to do that. Have to do that. Have to do that. So some of you are saying it's so early. Are we sure we're not on Hoax Channel? Look, man, we're, we're just getting, we're in training. Anna, we're in training. It's too early. It is too early. It, I agree that it's too early. We're in training. We're in trial training because come January, we're going to be in trial on East Coast time and it is going to be early. It's going to be early. The Murdoch case is going to be early. Maybe the court will just start at 10. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? I don't think it's going to happen. I think they are going to be doing a um a long time, a long, a long uh, stream day. So the lights are ever changing today. I just put them on. I put them on change. So they're doing what they want. So we're not necessarily code red. They're doing what they want. Check notifications. Mine kicked off. Yeah, they do that sometimes. YouTube will unsubscribe. YouTube will uncheck notifications. YouTube will do the things. I believe I put reminders. I I had set a, I had done the things. I had set a pre-reminder for um, community to go out today. It Community just yeeted it. We're changing, we're changing text crew providers. It's coming. I'm excited. It's happening soon. Um, and and hopefully we won't continue to have those problems. So I had to go back in and do that today. Then I set um, one on Twitter. Whether it went live or not, I don't know. Hopefully it did. And then I set one on Patreon as well. For those of you that are members on Patreon, you should get them. For those of you that are not members on Patreon, it is okay to just go follow me and you will get the public announcements I update these announcements in public so that e you can chat, you can say hello to the Law Nerds, and you will still get the notifications through that. So lawnerdsunite.com, there is a follow option, so you can go down and just follow it. So um, Miguelina asked, is my new mic stand on your Amazon store? No, it's not, because it's not on Amazon. I will have to link it. Um, I will have to link it. So if you want to just follow um, over there, if you, if you, it's fine. I completely understand like, Hey, I can't pay for a monthly thing, but you can follow it. And then you will get those announcements when the public ones go public. So, um, can confirm. See, there we go. All the notifications, <laughs> all the notifications. Hoke said, I love that this show is starting almost three hours after hangouts, <laughs> three hours after hangouts. <laughs> <laughs> and you were getting all these so early comments. It is so early. It's the, it's the, it's basically the middle of the night. It's basically the middle of the night. It's 9 a.m. And I was 10 minutes late. Don't tell the replay crew. Replay crew. We love you. We have some quick bits. We have some quick bits. 
I need to let me roll the intro and then we've got to do we've got to do this reply. We've got to do this reply. Um, I learned disturbing things about Hogue Law, though. I was listening to a, an older show. We're going to talk about that, too, since Hogue's in the chat. Since Hogue's, I learned an uncomfortable truth that we're going to chat about in just a minute. Hey there. If we haven't met yet, I'm Emily D. Baker, the badass lawyer. I didn't mean to do that. Hey there. If we haven't met yet, I'm Emily D. Baker, the badass lawyer and everyone's favorite legal commentator. I'm the host of The Emily Show, and I break down the legal shit behind the news and pop culture stories we all want to talk about. I have been a licensed attorney for over 15 years, but this is not legal advice. I should warn you, I'm a big fan of the cursey words. This channel is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not fuckery. I'm going to tell you what, my coffee is popping this morning. It is hot. It is delicious. It is so needed. We're professionals here. I don't know how I, how I, I, I think it's because I'm so truly, truly and deeply disturbed, um, like in my soul. But I heard our dear friend Hogue talking about his, his dear wife and the fact that she is an SC fan and doesn't mean South Carolina, actually means University of Southern California. And I was like, wait a second. I understand y'all, y'all are Michigan fans. I, I can accept that. But also, also USC fans, I don't know if I can hang. I don't know how one recovers. See, this is where reasonable minds can differ. Has to, has to save a friendship. Cause because I I I I very much enjoy the hoags. But um, but USC, it's just, you know, sometimes we have to learn to come together. We have to learn to come together across aisles and say, look, um, my, my, my family all went to, to UCLA and, uh, and I get it and I get it. But that said, my brother-in-law is also a massive USC fan. And, um, and we just look reasonable minds can differ and, and we have to, we have to learn how to do it. And I hope that in our, in our world of the U S we can start treating everything the way we, we treat sports fandoms where it's like, I can't believe you would do that, but we can still be friends. I think it's a, I think it's a learning lesson for everyone, for everyone. So there we go. Um, we are, we are just not, <laughs> we are just not SC fans over here. <laughs> Oak Law said co-counsels from California. That's not an excuse. <laughs> so it's deeply ingrained, not for everybody. We can all agree to hate Notre Dame. <laughs> I, um, I once went to visit a a friend at Notre Dame and got in a whole bunch of trouble. Got in a whole bunch of trouble for not for not following up, following all the rules when I went to visit Notre Dame. And um my friend got in a bunch of trouble for me not following all the rules. I felt horribly. I felt horribly. I'm also a very stubborn human and stupid rules don't always work well with me. And I was like, these rules are dumb. These rules are dumb. So anyway, anyway. Unfortunately, sport fandoms don't ruin each other's worlds. I mean, it, it depends on how your world is oriented, I think. I think. But again, it is all, I think, a matter of reasonable minds can differ and we have to be able to have conversations. We have to be able to have conversations. The Notre Dame fans in the chat are like, damn it. <laughs> um, somebody was laughing about rules at Notre Dame. My mom had a keg in the chapel at Notre Dame as an RA. That's That's pretty epic. That's pretty epic. I imagine. I imagine no one figured it out. Um, anyway, so <laughs> um, Florencia is like, I'm just chilling here as a Longhorns fan. You guys are welcome to drop your fandoms in the chat. We're gonna have to do a quick bits, and then we're gonna have to, we're going to have to. We're going to have to. Everybody's asking what kind of rules about Notre Dame dorm rules. There were a lot of dorm rules, frat organization rules, noise ordinances. Those are the ones that got me. I was too loud. Be shocked. Be shocked. Emily was too loud. Oh my God, this is going to be so, y'all, this is going to be so much fun. I've never been more tickled than with this microphone. I swear I'll stop playing with my mic um, eventually, but I can, it just look, look, it, I'm, I can't, I'm so excited. I'll stop. I'm going to get the comments. It's been happening a little bit lately. I'm going to get the comments like, you talked about your mic stand for exactly Three minutes and 27 seconds. Stop it. Um, so from South Carolina, is there another USC? No, 
there isn't. We we don't know her. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know another USC. We don't. We don't know her. Um, <laughs> I'm a Hoaglaw fan. Does that count? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Look, it's fair. My technically, my sister in law also spent time at USC. So we we do have family divided, and and we we all. We all just try to come together. I think almost everybody just goes ahead and hates Notre Dame. So it all works out. It all works out. <laughs> I'm feeling some office inspired hijinks with the moving mic. I love it until w the problem is going to be when Fred finds that it moves and puts his little pauses on the mic and try to and tries to mess with it. So, all right, we will continue. We will continue. Emily getting in trouble on a controlled campus is very on brand. Funny enough, I became a Michigan fan when we lived in East Lansing. I'm just a contrarian at heart. Go blue. Look, I've been to Michigan too. Michigan, we had a, was it Eastern? I think Eastern Nationals was at Michigan my freshman year. And um, so we played water polo and they were massive swim complex. Michigan swim complex is unlike anything I've ever seen. Uh, but yes, I needed a school like UMass that was just like, look, we got bigger problems. We got people like throwing sinks out of windows and and we've got bigger problems than you being loud at night. And I was like, this is the place for me. <laughs> this is going to work. We need a place where we can just be a little a little bit more myself. So with that, I'm going to roll the intro for quick bits. We're going to talk about, well, Sonny Balwani. We're going to, any TikTok creators in the chat, we're going to talk about TikTok. I'm sorry if you are a TikTok creator and that's your main gig. Um, look, the outlook does not look positive. The TikTok creators need to start doing the things, need to start doing the things, need, need to start doing the things on other platforms because it is not going to go well. So let's get to quick bits and then we're going to talk about Amber Heard again. I know. I know. There, um, we just, we can't not. Quick bits. All right. Our first story, we've got two of them because I want to get as much information as I can about what the judge decided for Sonny Balwani, who was sentenced to almost 13 years federal prison. More than the CEO, the CEO of Theranos, Elizabeth Holmes. He was the COO um, and in charge of the lab. We're going to talk about some thoughts about why Sonny Balwani might have gotten sentenced to more time. It's not a ton more time. He also got convicted of like a grip more charges, even though the judge pinned his sentencing range in the same range as Elizabeth Holmes. He was convicted of substantially more charges than she was, which might be enough of a reason. So... So let us go to this first story. Y'all be shocked. Look, put your shocked Pikachu faces on. I'm ready. I'm ready. My screen is shared. We are ready. It is happening. Um, I try to give us some diversity in platforms that we look at. So we're going to TechCrunch today. Theranos exec Sonny Balwani. That was ter That's terrible. That's terrifying. That's not. Can we can we go all the way? Can we go all the way with the reader version? No, what is happening? Give me my reader version. Tech crunch. We're per look, it's early. Don't fuck with me now. <laughs> Don't stop me now. All right. There are no execs. Sonny Balwani sentenced to 13 years in prison for defrauding patients and investors. The former COO, but di of disgraced blood testing startup Theranos, um, Ramesh Sonny Balwani was sentenced to 155 months or about 13 years. It's just under 13 years in prison and three years of probation. After a three-month trial, y'all, Balwani was found guilty on all 12 criminal charges. Holmes was not. Holmes was not found guilty on all of her charges. She was acquitted of some and some hung. So there's that. Ranging from defrauding patients and investors to conspiring to commit fraud. Theranos CEO Elizabeth Holmes was convicted on four of these charges and sentenced to 11.25 years in prison last month. So like 11 years, three months. Despite the disparate outcomes from the two separate jury uh, juries in two individual trials, Judge Ed Davila uh, calculated Holmes and Balwani's sentencing ranges to be the exact same, 135 to 168 months, which is really interesting seeing that he was facing so much more. He must have combined some of the stuff and said, look, these these are going to run together. Um, in both cases, prosecutor Jeff Schenk, if that's not how to pronounce it, 
I kind of don't care because it sounds cooler. Uh, Jeff Shank asked for 15 years. Well, he got pretty he got pretty close to it. Bowani's lawyers attempted to argue that he should get a more lenient sentence than Holmes as he was not the CEO. He is not Miss Holmes. He did not pursue fame and fortune, said Bowani's attorney. I mean, maybe not fame, but wait, the Theranos stuff is still going on? We're at the end. We're at the end of the Theranos stuff. Um, the reporter, John Carreyrou, who broke this story, said he was adding a updated afterward to his book, Bad Blood, because this really is the final chapter. It is. It is. <clears throat> it is. <coughs> Excuse me. It is the final chapter. This is it. They're going to appeal. Elizabeth Holmes is appealing. Um, Sonny Balwani is going to appeal. They're just going to appeal. These are criminal convictions. They're going to comp uh, appeal. But even if they appeal, it's unlikely. So they're going to appeal. So it's not done, done. But they're both going to go to prison. And he's going to turn himself in sooner than she will. Uh, he's also not, you know, about to give birth to a child. So that might account for it a little bit. Um, he's not Miss Holmes. He did not pursue fame and fortune. I say fortune, yes, fame, probably no. Judge Davila even noted that the court saw another side of Balwani when they were told about his charitable giving, some of which occurred after Theranos. Yet Balwani still received a severe sentence of 13 years. Your charity work's not going to save you from federal prison. It's just not. It's just not enough. Holmes and Bawani were supposed to be tried for fraud together, but the former CEO filed, a, uh, filed for a separate trial stating that Bawani, who is 20 years her senior, had emotionally and sexually abused her during their long romantic relationship. Though the court was not ruling on those allegations, the judge granted the request, and they did get separate trials. Throughout the trial, Bawani's lawyers attempted to make the case that even though he was an investor and executive at Theranos, he was not involved in key decision-making and it seems that no one believed him because do y'all believe he was not involved in key decision making? Here's the thing. They have the text messages. They have the text messages between the two of them showing how involved he was. So I don't know. If they believe it, the defense failed to argue for his innocence, though. In one piece of evidence, the jury was presented a text from Bawani to Holmes read, I am responsible for everything at Theranos. You think? You think that's going to come back to bite him? Yeah. I can just, I can look like I'm flashing to not real life, but the, the Hulu special of being like, I am the god of Theranos. Drink the green juice. Drink the green juice. Um... I can see it. Balwani's trial featured the same evidence that indicted Holmes. The prosecution focused on a key piece of evidence relating to Theranos' relationship with Walgreens. The biotech startup's uh, faulty technology made its way into 41 Walgreens stores, but unbeknownst to the pharmacy giant, most of the tests were conducted on third-party equipment. I would say improperly modified third-party equipment, just for sake of accuracy. Theranos' own machines couldn't produce accurate test results, so a lot of patients had blood drawn not with a finger prick, but intravenously. So Walgreens basically spent $140 million in its partnership. I love that they just are writing the way I talk now. In its partnership with Theranos for nothing. Uh, to use the same old tech that was already in use. Despite claims to the contrary, Walgreens executive testified he worked closely with Bawani on the deal. The prosecution also displayed evidence of a text from Bawani to Holmes stating that he deliberately didn't tell Walgreens that they were using different machines. Oh, you mean like you lied? Like you lied? Like you lied? Uh, um, for patients that were unlucky enough to have their blood tested with Theranos technology, some got wildly inaccurate results that caused significant disruption in their lives. In one case, a mother with a history of miscarriages was wrongly informed that she would have another unsuccessful pregnancy. The fucking emotional trauma that it causes to these people. I mean, just good God. Another patient, Aaron Tompkins, used Theranos for its low cost, got flagged as HIV positive, and then lived in limbo for three months until she could afford a second blood test. 
As it turned out, she didn't actually have HIV. Meanwhile, a patient named Meryl Elswin, Elsworth was given false, given a false cancer diagnosis. Literally the trauma. I mean, just unlike the jury at Holmes's trial, the jury at Bawani's trial held him accountable for defrauding patients, not just investors. That's why I read through the whole thing, because that might be key to the higher sentence. The jury did find him responsible for defrauding patients, for what was done to patients, and for the horrific, um, a horrific trauma people were put through. Um, it's just awful. You guys know what it's like waiting, even if it's not serious results. And, and some of you, law nerds, some of you know what waiting for results like this is like. Some of, a lot of you know what waiting for either your results or family members' results with regard to cancer and other things are like. You know how deeply upsetting it is to your entire life until you have answers, and even then. So it's just... It's just horrific. So that that uh, that might be part of the judge's decision. That there might be part of the judge's decision to sentence him for, to more time. Before the former COO sentencing, Bawani's lawyers filed 40 objections to the probation officer's pre-sentence investigation report, according to tweets from Law360 reporter Dorothy Atkins. TechCrunch is apparently A, not reading them, and B, not, um, not watching my videos because we covered some of those as well. Um, you can just grab those. We covered a lot of the objections. Judge Davila, who also presided over Holmes's trial, said that only four of those objections were substantive. Usually sentencing hearings are morbid regardless of the crime, like watching a car crash where you watch families and lives being destroyed in real time, Aikens tweeted from the courtroom. This one feels more like an accounting class. Interesting. Um, it would certainly not be unprecedented if Bawani decides to appeal the ruling. He's going to appeal the ruling. We don't go to TechCrunch for their legal reporting, to be fair. To be fair. After Holmes' own sentencing, the former Theranos CEO told a California federal judge that she would appeal her conviction. We know. She then asked to stay out of custody while her appeal is under consideration. Negative Ghost Rider, the pattern is full. Also citing that she is currently pregnant with her second child. As it stands, Holmes' surrender date is April 27th. Balwani will report to prison on March 15th. So let's go to some legal reporting and see if we glean any more information. But I think the larger convictions is probably, and especially the being convicted of defrauding patients, is a factor here in Balwani being sentenced to more time. Um, I got asked a lot yesterday on Twitter when I posted this story, and I'm sure I will get asked again here in the chat. So I'm just going to answer it before we go to um, before we go to questions at the end of the show. Why do they have time to turn themselves in? It is not uncommon that people get time to turn themselves in if they are already out of custody. You're not going to get someone that is in custody, released from custody, and then turning themselves back in. But when individuals have remained out of custody without incident, it is not unusual that they will get time to turn themselves in. This is particu uh, particularly true in nonviolent offenses. So um, with... With Sonny Balwani, he's been out of custody this entire time. The the company is defunct. There's not much more harm that can be done at this point. So allowing them out another few months to turn himself in is not uh, out of the question. So he's going to stay out on the same conditions he's been out on. So, ah, uh, my nose itches. So there's that. So that that is why they are allowed to stay out of custody. All right, let us go to... Now, whether you think that's right or not is a whole different thing that's up for debate. That's a value judgment. That's a value judgment. But does that happen typically in nonviolent crimes? Yes. Can that happen in federal violent crimes? Also, yes. Also, yes. Um, more common than in state crimes. The feds have more resources to go find you. Like, they're going to find you. Like they found Fat Leonard. The feds will find you. State courts and state state agencies do not have do not have the ability to go chase you down the same way the feds do. And so they tend to be a little less lenient depending on the jurisdiction. All right. Ex-Theranos uh, ex -Theranos exec Balwani gets nearly 13 years for fraud. We appreciate, we appreciate, this is the, the reporter they were just talking about in TechCrunch. We appreciate the, uh, the preciseness of the Law 360 reporting. 
During a hearing in San Jose, California, federal courtroom Wednesday, U.S. District Judge Davila sentenced the 58-year-old former Silicon Valley executive to 155 months behind bars, one month shy of 13 years, rejecting his arguments that he deserved only probation for his crime. Like Elizabeth Holmes, I, could you just let me work from home? Could you just, just let me work from home? It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Um, They did find Fat Leonard. They did. They did find Fat Leonard. We updated it during a quick bits a while back. Um, I'll have to look at when Fat Leonard's next court date is and update again. They did find Fat Leonard. Um, yeah, it wasn't very long after he escaped either. Let's see. Judge Davila pointed out that Balwani got his degree and worked for Microsoft and then started a business and sold it before joining Theranos. So sophistication might be part of the consideration here. That's something that's very common in this valley. It's interesting, perhaps tragic, to look at the path of this case to realize that the path has come full circle. What do they mean by full circle? I, it, I'm not quite sure what the judge means by that. The judge suggested Theranos' blood testing mission was a great idea and that Balwani was all in on it, but then there were problems. The lies are the problems. The lies. Then there were lies. Then there were lies. And the lies are the problem. Why did that have to happen? The judge asked. Defendant chose to go forward with deception, I'll call it, and continued to perpetrate that fraud. Lies, they were lies. They decided to go with the lies to continue on the mission. This, this, this is a case of the defendant's greed. The reason this case went forward, Your Honor, is because it was win at all cost. And win at all cost in entrepreneurship is often lauded as noble when at all cost no matter what the cost to yourself those around you it's often applauded as hustle it's applauded as 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 truly as noble um so what happens when when at all cost just involves lies they still see it as noble they still see it as we're doing good for the world and that mission is more important than anything else and that's how this case happens when at all cost is how this case happened. And when at all cost is a problem. It is a problem. It shouldn't be when at all cost. We shouldn't applaud, you know, we shouldn't applaud the behavior that leads to, we just have to keep going. 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 Because that's what leads to the lies to keep it going. In my opinion. My opinion. Let's make this bigger again. The judge held off on deciding restitution and asked the parties to meet and agree on a date for a future restitution hearing. So we're not done yet. Um, Hogue Law says all means necessary is just one of those big problem areas. I was actually just talking about that this morning vis-a-vis -vis righteous toxicity and the boozies of the world. Yeah, we see this a lot on Twitter. Hogue, this is an excellent point. We should just... We need to stream again together, but you stream very early. We'll have to we'll have to come to a common ground in the middle somewhere <laughs> in the morning. But the um the you know when it's my side that's winning, I don't care what what's done, and when it's the other side, I'm outraged by what's done. It's that hypocrisy that can be a problem, and that's in all things. You can't just be like you know in sports too. Eh, we deflated the balls a little bit, but I like that team, so it's fine. Um, there has to be some principled, principledness of it. Cheating is cheating, even if it benefits the people you like. You know, lies are lies, even if it benefits a purpose that seems good. <sighs> so I hear you, Hogue. In July, a unanimous jury convicted Balwani, who ser it has to be unanimous. It's not a civil case. Some things just don't need to be said who served as Theranos' president and chief operating officer from 2009 to 2016 on all 12 counts he faced. Following his conviction, Balwani urged Judge Davila to sentence him to a term of probation, arguing that he lost millions that he invested. Do you remember Elizabeth Holmes? Do you remember what Elizabeth Holmes' argument was? She lost her stocks. Everybody, she lost her stocks. She never cashed them out. And she went down with the ship. It was righteous. So don't send her to prison. These people have already lost money. But no one falsely told them they had cancer. 
So, you know, potato, potato, with all due sarcasm intended. He already lost millions he invested in Theranos and saying he received only $1 annual salary. They all receive the $1 annual salary and then all of the stock options. And then they're like, I only, I only got paid a dollar in salary. Yeah, well, guess what? The tax rate on your stocks is different than the tax rate on a salary. Don't tell me you're being noble. T tell me how, the, how, how taxes work for the rich again. Tell me that you're being taxed less on your stock dividends than you are on payroll. Tell me again how you're not paying payroll taxes on that. Tell me again. Tell me again. Tell me again how the government's taking less if you live off of stock options. My bad. Maybe I'm just being hyper cynical. Chat, am I being too cynical? I just had a $1 salary. It's not noble. It's just, it's just, it's just tax. Anyway, and a modest separate salary for serving on the board. Oh, oh, that's right. You also got paid for being on the board. Balwani also argued he never sought the fame or media attention Holmes received. Yeah, because then they'd find out your shit didn't actually work. That's true. That's true. I believe that. Prosecutors argued in their own sentencing memo that Balwani deserved 15 years prison and should be ordered to pay up to $804 million in restitution. Maybe not to himself. Maybe he doesn't get paid back as an investor. In the days leading up to Balwani sentencing, his defense team and prosecutors teed up a heated fight over how the court should calculate investor loss. That fight is not over yet. But on Wednesday, Judge Davila mostly sided with prosecutors in calculating investor loss, finding that there are 12 Theranos investor victims who lost a total of $120 million for the purpose of calculating, calculating the sentencing, putting his sentencing guideline range between 135 and 168. The amount of restitution to be paid will be determined later. This is for the sentencing guidelines. This is a like, it's in the $120 million range for sentencing purposes. During the hearing, the prosecutor argued 15 years is appropriate due to Bawani's role in preparing Theranos financial projection, projections, role in the nine-figure deal with Walgreens, and direct communications with investors. He also had a sig significant autonomy in the Theranos lab where the greatest harm occurred. I agree with that too. But Bawani's counsel, Jeff B. Cooper Smith, we love it when you leave in a middle initial. Those of us that use our middle initials, we appreciate it. Argued that there's myth in the media about Balwani. The federal judge doesn't give a fuck what the media said about him. That's you telling the media that you think they suck while they're all sitting there in the room, which is really awkward when you're in court and all the media is sitting behind the lawyers and the lawyers are arguing about the media to the judge. It's it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to witness. Um which I've only seen in, in the Britney Spears hearings, but the, the judge is not swayed by the media. Uh, the letters submitted to the court show he's a person who cares about his community and family and has donated extensively. Okay. Cooper Smith argued that Balwani worked hard at Theranos to help others. I don't doubt that, but you can't lie. The attorneys also urged the court not to issue the same very harsh sentence that Holmes received. It looks like the court took you up on that and issued a very harsher sentence. They say in part because Balwani didn't seek the media attention. The media attention is not the problem. The lying's the problem. The media attention is not the issue. I mean, unless you're correlating the media attention to the reason they were able to so successfully lie. Mm. He's unfortunately radioactive as a result of this whole affair of the fraud scheme. Of course he, of course he is. How do you get a job after this? A company can't hire him. They put themselves at risk. They put their investors at risk. He's, com he's a convicted felon. I'm sure he would be able to work in the non, the non, you know, tech industry. I'm sure there are jobs he can find, but yes, kind of radioactive. Kind of radioactive, not surprised. And not like the good kind, not like the song. Radioactive. 
after the attorney's arguments, Balwani declined to make a statement to the court. Isn't that interesting? Elizabeth Holmes cried to the court and apologized. Balwani said nothing. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and then we know again that he is surrendering um, in March. So to prison they go. We'll determine or the court will determine the amount of restitution later. And um, and from there, this will be done. I don't know if we're going to get a um, the dropout part two on Hulu covering this. Don't you want one? They were all in court. Like there were so many people that sat through the trial. I kind of want to drop out part two, like the season two covering the fallout. I would love that. I don't know if we're going to get one, but I would love that. So let us talk about TikTok. Let us talk about TikTok. Y'all, this is a overview of the TikTok lawsuits. There are a fuck ton of them right now. There are a fuck ton of lawsuits right now. This is the beginning of the end. There are lawsuits going on in California, now Indiana. There are others in Illinois. There are going to be suits like this, I think, in most states. Also coming from Law 360, Indiana sues TikTok over Chinese data sharing and kids' safety. There have been class actions that have recently been settled over the same things. States are going to try individually to shut TikTok down. And in some regards, they may be successful. Indiana's Attorney General on Wednesday unleashed a pair of lawsuits uh, accusing popular video sharing app TikTok of being a Chinese Trojan horse that misled users about the Chinese government's access to their personal data and has exposed children to inappropriate content. In separate complaints, and we'll go through the complaints another day if we need a deep dive. Um, this needs an entire segment if we need a deep dive on the TikTok lawsuits because there are so many of them. And these would just be the state lawsuits. There are individual lawsuits as well, individual class actions as well. So we have multiple states' attorney generals suing TikTok and then multiple class actions against TikTok. One that was just settled for like millions and millions and millions. We'll we'll go to that news story in a second. Um, quote, the TikTok app, the TikTok app is a malicious and menacing threat unleashed on unsuspecting Indiana consumers by a Chinese company that knows full well the harms it inflicts on its users. With this pair of lawsuits, we hope to force TikTok to stop its false, deceptive, and misleading practices, which violate Indiana law. While well, Wednesday's lawsuits are the first lodged by a state attorney general against TikTok, um, oh, they were banned. Which state banned them? They were banned in one state. And the California ones might be class actions. Um, they were banned. I don't remember which state banned them. Um, South Dakota. There we go. Red Panda CPA, because the chat is ba banned them on state devices. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, the platform has faced scrutiny from regulators, lawmakers, and class action plaintiffs for years. Last month, the California resident hit TikTok. We were meant to go over that, and we ran out of time like three times. With a proposed class action in federal court that accuses the platform of violating wiretap and consumer protection laws by secretly collecting massive amounts of invasive information. We're going to go over those, not today. The lawsuit comes on the heels of FBI directors warning to the House Homeland Security Committee that the Chinese government could weaponize TikTok to carry out influence operations by controlling the content suggested to users. Nonprofit consumer advocacy group Public Citizen also urged the FTC and Congress to investigate ByteDance, which public citizen claims has unlawfully tracked the physical locations of specific U.S. citizens to conduct surveillance on them. Both federal and state governments have also taken action to address data privacy and security concerns raised by the popular app. Late in former President Trump's administration, the U.S. Department of Commerce tried to force ByteDance to sell the platform's U.S. operations or force a ban. Two federal court injunctions halted the ban, under mostly under free speech grounds. Um, the issue reached the Third Circuit, but the case became moot after Biden rescinded the TikTok ban through an executive order. Additionally, Republican governors in South Dakota, Maryland, and South Carolina within the past month have moved to ban government employees from installing or using TikTok on state-owned devices or networks. I think that's just probably smart. Um, but I think that's probably smart with any social media app on a work phone. I think all of them 
collect data and collect government data. While TikTok says its platform is all about spreading joy, the suit claims that the app collects reams, stacks, stacks, stacks of highly sensitive and personal information about the consumers, including their interests, locations, and even where your eyes are looking on your phone. What? TikTok knows how much Bradley Thorne I'm watching, and I, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. Can you imagine TikTok being like, hey, <laughs> we're going to now blackmail you. We know what you've been looking at on TikTok. We know. She knows. She knows. Can you imagine TikTok being like, we know. We know exactly what you're looking at on TikTok. Stop it. Stop it. We're going to look at all the videos you've liked under Sam Sam Smith's unholy sound, and we're going to tell the world. Can you imagine the blackmail? Can you imagine the blackmail? Can you imagine the blackmail? That's disgustingly invasive. Um, we don't allow peeping toms. It, well, stacks and stacks. It is stacks and stats. So creepy. Wow. So TikTok equals Santa Claus. Yes. They see you when you're sleeping. They know when you're awake. They know if you've been bad or good. Yes. 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 Yep. It works. It works surprisingly well, Red Panda CPA. Surprisingly well. But I can see the blackmail applications for this immediately. Immediately. Not the gray sweatpants. I can tell Emily and my FYP is alike. Probably, Amanda. It probably is. It probably is. Um, mittens, all the murder kittens. I watch a lot of murder kittens, but the eye tracking. Woo. Um, so look, here's the thing. I think the government has always been right. This is the thing about politicians is it's hard when you hate them to be like, well, that was a good idea. But there are some things that I just wish when we changed parties, in the presidency over and over that everything didn't get yeeted. I feel like this needed to maybe not get yeeted and continue to get looked into. And I realize that the, the growing voting demographic loves this app. I get it. I get it. But I think sometimes safety needs to come above popularity. And the government has been warned about TikTok for years um, in a way different than other apps. Um, not to say other social medias don't don't glean an inordinate amount of data. Um, even where your eyes are looking at your phone, look, y'all. Look. What happens in 10 years when we have people running for office that were heavily on TikTok in their private life before they started running for office and somebody goes to them and is like, hey, this is all the information we have on you. So um, what we need you to do is that's the concern for me is the future application of the amount of knowledge gleaned. Um, I also have a huge concern about how politics and deep fakes are going to be a, a massive problem in years to come, but we're going to be here to talk about it together. I'm not going anywhere because this is going to be a mess. There are those of you that are like, I only have Facebook. Also, Facebook will, will advertise to you based on who you're in proximity to. They're like, hey, You've been with this person today. Your phones are near each other. Your phones are your phones are buddies. You're near each other. This person just bought that. You might like that. It's why it sometimes seems like Facebook is actually listening to the conversations you have. It's not always that it's listening. It's that it knows what that person was searching for on their phone and might assume that you've talked about it and then will serve you that data. Um, so it's not just TikTok. TikTok is, is the hardest to regulate. TikTok then, it says, deceives and misleads users about what's being done with this information and the risks risks associated with this app. TikTok statements and omissions paint a picture for Indiana consumers that there is minimal risk of the Chinese government and or the Communist Party, which controls the government, accessing and exploiting their data. These statements are false, deceptive, and misleading. The highly sensitive data that TikTok collects from Indiana consumers is accessible by individuals and entities subject to Chinese law and China's oppressive regime, including but not limited to laws requiring cooperation with China's national intelligence institutions and cyber security regulators. Look, national security in, in some of these regards needs 
to be a priority, even if it's going to piss some people off or piss some countries off. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, The AG is seeking a permanent injunction to force TikTok to stop misleading consumers and downplaying the risk of their personal data being shared. TikTok is a wolf in sheep's clothing, the attorney general says. As long as TikTok is permitted to deceive and mislead Indiana consumers about the risk of their data, those consumers and their privacy are easy prey. You know, I appreciate. I appreciate states stepping up and doing this. I think they're, you know, I am generally not a massive government girl. Um, but I think when it comes to the security of the populace, maybe it's where we need some, you know, we need some commonality, but we're going to, the states are just going to be like, fuck it. We'll do it ourselves then. Um, which is fair. The attorney general claims that in order to lure 13 to 17 year olds onto the platform, TikTok makes a variety of misleading representations and omissions to make the app appear safe and appropriate for underage users and secure a 12 plus rating on the app store. Interesting, because you have to be 13 to be on the platform. Shouldn't it be 13 plus? And a T for teen rating in the Google Play Store. Shouldn't it be 13 plus? However, once these teens are on the platform, many are exposed to nonstop offerings of inappropriate content that the TikTok algorithm force feeds to them, according to the Attorney General, who asserts that the dissemination to underage users of videos depicting Themes such as alcohol and drug use, sexual content, intense profanity. Can we not put intense profanity in there? Look, there's a lot of harmful shit on TikTok. A lot of harmful ideas on TikTok. That happens where any platform where there's people, there are harmful ideas. But can we not pretend, can we just not pretend that profanity is going to be the end fucking all? Maybe I'm biased. Am I biased? Is profanity the end all? Like, normalizing normalizing drug use might be more damaging to teens um sexualizing teens problem but also there's a lot of harmful diet culture on tiktok so like the intense profanity might not be the fucking problem but okay um and that those are frequent and intense rather than infrequent and mild what we've seen we need to circle back sidebar we need to circle back to the moderator lawsuit, I believe it was TikTok mods, it could have been Facebook mods, that sued over the disgusting content that they were exposed to having to um, having to weed through on these platforms. I think protecting kids, I think protecting kids needs to be our priority. Emily feels, pers- I am personally victimized by, I am. I've been personally attacked in this writing from the secretary of from the secretary of state of indiana i am personally attacked Pers- i'm very much attacked <laughs> cursy words are not the end all anyway but it I, oh. the resulting harm to young people and society writ large has been devastating um he argues that exposing ex- being exposed to this content can and does influence teens behavior in a manner that causes significant harm pointing in particular to one Indiana school district that saw increased instances of vandalism attributable to social media trends linked to TikTok. Ah, yeah, there was a trend going around that was destroying school property, like ripping out sinks and, and all kinds of shit. In multiple ways, TikTok represents a clear and present danger, a clear and present danger to Hoosiers that is hiding in plain sight in their own pockets. At the very least, the company owes consumers the truth. We're going to be following this. You guys, let's put up a poll. We're going to move on to Amber Heard. Let's put up a poll. Do we need to do we need to dive deeper into what the fuck's going on with TikTok? Should we do that? Should we do that? All right, let's put up a poll. Do we need a deep dive into all of the TikTok lawsuits? Yes or no? We're going to move on to Amber Heard. I know it's what most of you want to hear. I know. I know. We're doing it now. So everybody in the chat's like, have we talked about it yet? No, we're doing it now. We give everybody plenty of time to come in. And I like our quick bits a lot. So let us... Um, Mary Carey said, I'm sorry, but there was a trend of what? There was a TikTok trend of school vandalism. Um, like ripping out toilets, ripping out sinks, like, like off, like, like vandalism, damaging vandalism uh to schools that was going around. It was a stupid trend, but it was a trend. So um Somatica said apparently there's a trend a client showed me where they are decorating school bathrooms with Christmas trees. That one I'm not so mad about. The ripping out tiles and stuff, I'm a little more mad about. Decorating bathrooms with Christmas decor is kind of funny. Uh, Ripping out the toilet paper dispensers, things like that. Yep. All right. So 
Let us, let us continue. Um, there was a NyQuil chicken trend. Yep. I mean, there was the Tide Pod challenge. There were people licking toilets. There have been lots of, there have been lots of trends that are a problem. Here's the thing about teens. Um, their brains aren't fully developed yet and they make bad choices. So if you're constantly feeding them things and they're like, that seems like a good idea. They're going to be in the middle of the street going like, Kiki, do you love me? Are you riding? That's the only part of that dance I remember. Like in the car. Do you remember the police department that did the Kiki challenge? <laughs> because people were getting run over by their own vehicles. Run over by their own vehicles. Are you riding? And then there was the box, the crate challenge, where people were falling off of very high heights of crates. Again, when adults act like idiots and in injure themselves, I'm just like, well, that was a bad idea. The thing is, teens are, we protect children because their brains aren't fully developed yet and they are more want to make very bad choices. <sighs> so don't forget the don't breathe challenge. I mean, I mean, uh, the cinnamon, ch the cinnamon challenge. Yes. Um, Tracy said, my friends who is a cybersecurity expert said, Tix, TikTok is very bad to have on your phone. Yeah, it tracks. There is lots of evidence that TikTok will track everything you do on your phone. Every email you send, every call you make tracks everything associated with your phone. Yep. Yep. There is there has been evidence of that. So it's a it's it's a problem. It's a problem. So um I saw a question about charging teens as adults. I'm gonna save, I'm gonna well it. Darn it, my chat jumped. I was going to try to save that to talk about. That's a longer conversation to talk about in um, Q&A. So I will try to. I will try to grab it. Um, yes, I will try. I will try to grab that and chat about it when we get to questions because it it will get far afield. Emily's quick bits. Yeah, they're not quick. <laughs> quick bits is now becoming more of a facetious title. All right, let's talk about. <sighs> let's talk about Amber Heard and Johnny Depp. Look, this case isn't over. There's so much. There's so, so much. There's so much. And again, well, let me just swoop. Here we are again. Johnny Depp and Amber Heard went to trial. There are appeals. Both parties are appealing. Johnny Depp's appeal was a little more uh, pointed. Fewer, fewer topics. Really just the one because he was only found liable on the one statement made by attorney Adam Waldman, who is now back on Twitter. So I've been following along with that. Interesting stuff. Amber Heard also appealed. Her appeal got a, was a little delayed. She got an extension. She got a page extension. She's appealing on all the things, more like a, throwing spaghetti against a wall. Though there were, some interest, there were some interesting arguments in Amber Heard's appeal. There are some topics I'm like, ooh, I want to see what the court does with that. I'm curious. Some arguments, some good arguments. Elaine is not involved in any of these. So I'm curious, curious to see what happens. Um, in that with appeals, you get the appellate brief. God, my in-ears, I need a longer cord. You get the appeals. These are really pissing. They are really pissing me off today. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm distracted because they are just, they are just a mess today. And I'm sitting further back. So now they are pulling. All right. All right. I will scoot up. I was so comfortable. I will scoot. My in-ears are like, girl, you don't have that much room. You need to get closer to that computer. Um, Amber Heard filed an appeal. The reply's not in yet. So we have Johnny Depp's appeal and Amber Heard's reply. And then we have Amber Heard's appeal. We're waiting on Johnny Depp's reply. And then there's the amicus or the amica briefs. I have not covered those. We will get it. We will get it. We will get it. So the amicus briefs, um, are interesting. So we will do another, we will do another video on that. We're, we're covering this first. Sorry, y'all. We, cause we didn't cover the original amicus. Look, we've got other things to talk about. I'm trying to balance. So we didn't talk about the, um, the, we didn't talk about the amicus yet. All right. I think that was a pretty good road so far. So Johnny Depp's appeal is on kind of three precise issues. I'm going to pull this up real quick because we're this is what we're going to see addressed. We got, um, where are the arguments? The trial court erred in denying Mr. Depp's motion for summary judgment and motion to strike. The trial court erred in denying the proposed jury instructions. 
the trial court erred in excluding all the in excluding the full articles containing the Waldman statements. I think they've gone in argument to um, strongest to to weakest. I think they've put their biggest arguments at the top and then reserved their other arguments. And then within the trial court erred in denying Mr. Depp's motion for summary judgment and motion to strike. The three arguments there is that Waldman is an independent contractor and Depp then can't be responsible for shit that he says. Uh, Heard presented no evidence of Waldman's malice and Waldman's statements are not actionable. So those are the three arguments that we are looking to see reply to. What's interesting is that we are getting a reply, not with our favorite font. Look, look, man. This is from the Lex group who did the formatting. I'm here for it. I am literally here for everything this font. (laughs) I'm here for it. I am. This different, different legal printing group um, is not with the same sassy font. It's a very clean font, but it's not the same, same, same sassy font. So this is just Rottenborn, just Rottenborn's firm. So this is different than Amber Heard's appeal that had multiple uh, law firms on it. I wonder if Rottenborn is handling the Depp appeal because he was trial counsel and was present. Look, when the le- when it came to the legal arguments and it was just Rottenborn arguing, he did a good job arguing just the legal arguments. He did. He has a he had a very linear argument. His opening statement was the strongest. His closing argument was the strongest for Team Heard. I think Rottenborn is a smart attorney. Um, I think he's probably very well suited for this. He was very good with technical legal arguments. Um, and I wonder if he's been hired alone to handle the replies to the Depp appeal where there are multiple law firms working with the Amber Heard appeal. So we will see. Um, the chat's like, I find it interesting that it's just him. Um, wait, so you're saying Rottenborn isn't sassy. Rottenborn is not sassy, but he, I can follow him. Um, he wasn't likable, but he was capable. He was not, he was not super likable, but very good on the technical legal arguments. If, and I, I will maintain it. I said it at the beginning too. If the case that Rottenborn laid out in his opening alone had been the case they presented, it would have been, it it would have been stunning for Johnny Depp to win. It was already shocking that Johnny Depp won, but Rottenborn laid out a very clear path to victory. And then Elaine and Amber Heard just, just threw grenades on it. All right. Table of authorities, statement of the case, statement of facts. They talk about May 21st because that's what the statements relate to. Hopefully they stick to just May 21st. I doubt it. Depp's intent to retaliate against her, the Depp and Waldman relationship, motion for summary judgment, motions to strike, the refused jury instructions on independent contractors, and then argument. Depp's independent contractor theory is an opposite to whether Mr. Waldman is his agent. Standard of review, Waldman can be both an independent contractor and an agent. The circuit court properly denied the motion to strike because whether Mr. Waldman's statement Whether Mr. Waldman made this statement while acting as Depp's agent was a question of fact, therefore for the jury. The court need not adopt any rules regarding whether attorneys are independent contractors as a matter of law. Ms. Heard presented sufficient evidence with regard to actual malice. I'm really curious to see their argument there. Mr. Depp waived any argument that summary judgment should have been granted. Standard of review. Heard can prove defamation by showing either Mr. Depp or Mr. Waldman had actual malice. I don't know if I agree with that argument. I'm interested to see how they how they talk through it. I don't know if I agree. I don't think it gets to be anyone's state of mind and I don't think it's a is it a pass through state of mind? Who it's the speaker's state of mind. So I'm interested to see. The statement is actionable because it contains a provably false factual connotation. The statement is not protected speech. The circuit correctly rejected the proposed jury instructions on independent contractors. The jury instruction fully and fairly covered principles of agency. The circuit court did not abuse its discretion by re, uh, requiring redaction of irrelevant and in, inadmissible portions of the article. Abuse of discretion is a very hard standard to meet. Um, so that's why that is the the argument at the end. 
The redacted portions of the Waldman of the article were an admissible conclusion certificate. So 50 pages. Here's our case law. Zoom, zoom. Other authorities. Ah, restatements of agency. Fantastic. We've got parts of the Virginia code. Let's do law things. All the law things. All the law things. Also, I'm just going to take a minute because I'm a bad YouTuber. We're professionals here. Do the likey, subscribey things. You know what to do. It's YouTube. It actually does really matter in the algorithm and it does help the channel. And I always forget to say it. But, you know, I would like to continue to grow as a YouTuber and you know, take over the world. <laughs> I'm teasing. I would at least, I would really like to hit a million subscribers. Maybe just take over the legal space as a streamer. Maybe. Maybe. Statement of the case. During the course of their relationship, appellant John C. Depp, we're going to go with Depp and Heard the entire time, abused his wife, Heard, physically, verbally, emotionally, and psychologically. She made a lot of testimony about sexual abuse and sexual assault. They left it out of the closing argument. It goes to the, it goes to the, to one of the statements that she was found or that the jury found was defamatory. They never include it here. Never, never. And it's intentional. And I wonder why. Mr. Depp promised her that if she ever left him, he would make her think of him every single day by ruining her career and life. After she obtained a protective order against him and commenced divorce proceeding, temporary, and commenced divorce proceedings, Depp did everything in his power to keep that promise. This was basically his opening. In describing Heard around the time of their divorce, Depp stated, quote, she's begging for total global humiliation. She's going to get it, and I will stop at nothing. The jury obviously didn't care. Mr. Depp has marshaled agents to advance his global campaign. And, I mean, if you're going to start throwing those kind of stones, <laughs> who has Amber Heard marshaled for her global campaign? I'm going to stop and just read this. But, but, if we're going to talk about marshaling agents, it's appropriate here, but let's not pretend that Amber Heard has sat there and just been like, <clears throat> I have... <laughs> I'm just going to, we're just going to stop and keep going. I'm, I, you know what I mean? I'm not going to rant. I'm not going to rant. Um, Mr. Depp has marshaled agents to advance his global campaign, including his lawyer, Mr. Adam Waldman. Mr. Depp retained Mr. Waldman shortly after announcing he would stop at nothing to globally humiliate Ms. Heard. Mr. Waldman assists Mr. Depp with publicity holds himself out to the press as Mr. Depp's lawyer and has been quoted in several articles stating Ms. Heard is carrying out an abuse hoax. And the jury found some of those statements weren't defamatory. Mr. Waldman also works to generate negative press about Ms. Heard. Specifically, Mr. Waldman filed a report with the Los Angeles Police Department alleging Ms. Heard perjured herself. And it never would have come up at trial if y'all didn't ask about it. Y'all asked about it. The only reason I knew about it is because y'all asked about it. The only reason we heard Amber Turden trial is because y'all asked about it. Y'all opened a whole lot of doors you don't want to you don't want to argue about. Waldman filed a report with the LAPD alleging her had perjured herself and then created a story about his claim by telling a news outlet that the LAPD had opened a criminal investigation into perjury by Ms. Heard. I mean, they might have very well said that they did. The defamatory statement at issue in this appeal concerns the last occasion in which Mr. Depp physically abused Ms. Heard, May 21st, 2016. When describing this day to the Daily Mail, a tabloid published in the United Kingdom and online, Mr. Waldman falsely stated, quote, Quite simply, this was an ambush, a hoax. They, Ms. Heard and her friends, set Mr. Depp up by calling the cops, but the first attempt didn't do the trick. The officers came to the penthouses, thoroughly searched and interviewed, and left after seeing no damage to face or property. So Amber and her friends spilled a little wine and roughed the place up, got their story straight under direction of a lawyer and a publicist, and then placed a second call to 911. 
what we didn't see evidence of. And I kind of, I, I still, we haven't seen evidence of it. I still want to know. What we didn't see evidence of is if Mr. Waldman thought this was false. How do we know that Mr. Waldman thought that this statement was false? He went to LAPD and made a report about perjury. Can't we, couldn't the jury have found, well, they didn't because they found this to be defamatory, but how do they find malice here? How do they find that he knew this was false? How do we know that Waldman knew this was false? Waldman wasn't there. It's kind of, Waldman's statements, I think, are more like uh, the son's statements. Waldman was relying on what he was told, but you're never going to know what he was told because it's all attorney-client privilege. So I don't know how they found malice on this, and I want to know. I want to know. Following Mr. Da and hopefully Rottenborn will tell us. Rottenborn, tell us. Tell us how they found malice. Tell us how you proved malice. We are so confused. We would like to be enlightened. Following Mr. Depp's suit arising out of Ms. Heard's op-ed in which she described public backlash faced by women who alleged who alleged violence, Ms. Heard filed a counterclaim for defamation seeking redress for reputational harm caused by the statement and others. Some that were dismissed before trial, some that she lost on. Mr. Depp moved for summary judgment, arguing the statement was an opinion and that Ms. Heard could not prove actual malice. The court... Fairfax, correctly denied the motion finding the statement was actual because it was capable of being proven false. The circuit court also denied summary judgment because the record contained disputed facts regarding whether the statement was made with actual malice and the jury gets to decide. I added that in, but the jury gets to decide. The case proceeded to trial where the court properly excluded the contents of the full article that contained the statement because it constituted inadmissible hearsay and was not necessary for the jury to assess whether the statement was defamatory. That's not what Depp's arguing, but okay. The conclusion of the evidence on Ms. Hurd's counterclaim, and again, at the conclusion of all evidence, Mr. Depp moved to strike. We covered it. Mr. Depp reiterated the arguments in his motion for summary judgment, contending the statement was an opinion published without actual malice. The jury gets to determine malice. I agree. I agree. Um, Hogue said the court basically allowed Depp's actual malice since he would know the truth to be instructed to the jury as sufficient to make the case for Waldman's malice. It was a confusing instruction, but yes, it was kind of like a pass through malice. I don't know how you even get to pass through malice. Like, oh, well, Depp knew it wasn't true, so he shouldn't have told Walt. I, I don't think, I don't know how we get there, which is actually why I'm interested to see what the appeals court says on these. I hope they get to these questions because I want to know who's malice. Shouldn't it be the speaker? But if they're acting as an agent, then is it the malice of the person you're an agent for? Or doesn't the agent take on your action? So if Johnny Depp takes on Waldman's action, then Johnny Depp should take on Waldman's state of mind and not the other way around. What do I know? Mr. Depp also argued that he could not be liable for Waldman's conduct because he was an independent contractor rather than an employee. The court was disinclined to acquiesce to that request and did not revisit its ruling. I interjected that and did not. The, wouldn't that be fucking funny? Um, they were disinclined to acquiesce to that request and to revisit its ruling uh, that the statement was actionable and correctly ruled that Ms. Heard presented sufficient evidence of actual malice. The court further held that Ms. Heard presented sufficient evidence that Mr. Waldman was acting as Depp's agent when he made the statement. I don't even know. I think the court was like, send it all to the jury. Mr. Depp tendered several jury instructions regarding his theory that Mr. Waldman was an independent contractor. The circuit court refused these instructions, holding the concept of an independent contractor did not apply to this case, and no evidence supported the proposed instruction. Okay. Following deliberations, the jury returned a favor... Uh, sorry, the jury returned a verdict in favor of Ms. Heard with respect to the statement. The circuit court entered judgment in accordance with the verdict and subsequently entered a final order. This appeal followed statement of facts. We're going to zoom, zoom. We're going to zoom, zoom. Because, look, we know the statement of facts. We know. I'm just interested to see how they spin it. The court views the evidence presented at trial in a light most favorable to the prevailing party. 
So viewed the uh, so viewed the evidence at trial established that in May 2016 the party's marriage was falling apart due to Mr. Depp's alcoholism, drug use, and abuse of his wife. I don't know if that's what this verdict tells us. On May 21st, 2016, the couple did uh, the couple had not seen each other for one month, but Mr. Depp contacted Miss Heard to ask if he could come home because his mother had passed away. He told Ms. Heard that he really needed his wife, and while she felt conflicted because the situation had gotten better with Johnny mentally due to his hadn't gotten better due to his drinking and drug use, she agreed he could return home to the penthouses that he owns. When Mr. Depp arrived in the early evening, he was inebriated. He was peaceful at first, but later began talking about a prank he insisted was carried out by one of Ms. Heard friend, Ms. Heard's friends, Io Tillett Wright, the grumpy. Mr. Depp claimed that Mr. Wright defecated in Miss Heard's bed so that he would find feces there. We're back to the poop. We're back to the poop. There was no getting away from the poop. There was poop, poop, poop. Lots of poop. All the poop. Poop. <laughs> poop. We're not getting away from the poop. Um, we're also not getting away from the opportunity to disparage Johnny Depp because this is their filings and that is what they are going to do. Light, most evitable, light, light, most favorable to them. And Rottenborn is not letting it go. Rottenborn's like drugs, 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 drinking, drugs, 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 drinking, drinking, drugs, drugs, bad, drinking, bad. The jury, I don't think gave a shit about that. I think what the jury gave a shit about is that the police contradicted Waldman's statement. And so they're like, oh, that's false. Miss Heard called Mr. Wright and placed him on a speakerphone in an attempt to resolve the matter. During the call, Mr. Depp became angry, grabbed the phone and screamed at Mr. Wright, Mr. Wright, who is a member of the LGBTQIA community. He yelled at the top of his lungs, uh, insults, among other expletive insults, and told Mr. Wright he could have Miss Heard. Mr. Depp then tossed the phone on the couch and proceeded upstairs. Ms. Heard retrieved the phone and began apologizing to Io. Io, who was still on speakerphone and knew um, of Depp's abuse of Heard on previous occasions, responded, Amber, get out of the house. Get out of the house now. You're not safe. Get out of the house. Mr. Depp heard this statement while he was on the staircase and bolted down the stairs. Well, is he drunk or is he bolting down the stairs? Depp grabbed the phone from Heard and began berating Io again. After he finished screaming at Io, Depp threw the phone at Heard, who was sitting on the couch. The phone hit Heard's face on, quote, what felt like her eye. Heard then put her head in her hands and began crying and said, you hit me with the phone. In response, Mr. Depp said, oh, yeah, I hit you, huh? Question. And then hit Miss Heard on the top of the head and pulled her off the couch by her hair. Heard tried to cover her face and protect herself while Depp continued to pull her around the room by her hair and mock her and mocked her. Referring to her face, he said, let me see how bad I hurt you. Let me see it. Let me see how bad I hurt you this time. What if I pull your hair back? At trial, Heard introduced numerous photos. Okay. Taken later that night and the following days. Well, some of them were taken at the exact same time, but I, right. Showing the marks and bruising on her face caused by Depp throwing the phone at her. Meanwhile, at some point during the altercation, Wright called 911. The physical altercation subsided when Heard's friend Pennington, who lived in an adjacent penthouse, entered the room. Pennington, female Pennington, she Pennington, got into uh got in between Mr. Miss Good Lord, Heard got in between Heard and Depp, put her hands on Depp's chest and said, Johnny, no. Depp swatted at Raquel's hands um, and barreled towards Heard, who had retreated to the couch. Raquel then covered Heard with her arms while Depp stood over them, screaming, Amber, get the fuck up, about 10 times. At that point, two of Depp's security guards entered the apartment and persuaded Depp to leave. Then they got onto the staircase. As Mr. Depp was leaving, he picked up a Magnum bottle that he had brought with him and smashed various items of personal property with the bottle, which again contradicts the police testimony. The damaged property included framed photographs, displays of bead necklaces that Pennington had prepared for an art show, items in Miss Heard's office, such as keepsake boxes. Depp also spilled wine in the hallway outside their home, footnote one. 
The couple's home is comprised of multiple apartments located in the Eastern Columbia building in Los Angeles. The apartments are often referred to as penthouses at trial. It's a fair footnote. Not sassy, but fair. Heard presented evidence of this property damage at trial. After Mr. Depp left with a security... Though nobody said they smelled wine at all, ever. None of the police, not the first round, not the second round, nobody smelled wine. After Mr. Depp left with his security guards, Heard learned that Io called 911 and law enforcement was on its way. Heard panicked because she did not know what law enforcement was going to do when it saw property damage in our home. And you're allowed to trash your own home. She testified, I wanted to protect Johnny. I didn't want him to be arrested. I didn't want him to be in trouble. I didn't want the world to know. I didn't want this abuse to come out. She called her attorney who assists her with entertainment law matters for advice. He gave her the contact information of a domestic relations attorney as a result of a conversation with that attorney. I Okay. Ms. Hurd told the two enforcement law enforcement officers who responded that she refused to cooperate at this time based on advice of the attorney. After speaking with her, the officers walked through the apartments and comprised uh, that comprised the couple's home, gave her a business card in case she changed her mind about cooperating, and departed. Once the officers left, her and her friends cleaned up the apartment so their dogs did not step on any broken glass. They did not call a publicist or summon law enforcement. About an hour after the first pair of officers departed, however, a second pair of officers responded to the home. Her did not know additional officers had been called until they arrived. She declined to cooperate with them. And they departed after confirming Ms. Heard was safe and without searching the apartments. I mean, they didn't search, but they did come in. Heard filed a petition for dissolution of the party's marriage at the end of May 2016. She realized the violence on May 21st, 2016, that despite all of her efforts, this is just retelling their story. Like, I get it. I get it. Um, though the jury didn't believe all of this. They said Mr. Depp's violent behavior, quote, was now normal and not the exception, and she feared that it was going to end really badly for her if she did not leave him. She obtained the temporary, sorry, she retained, she obtained a protective order. I'm just trying to read what they wrote. I will try to be mindful when I interject for those of you just listening along that I'm adding introduction. The sass is me. Rottenborn is not a snappy writer. It's very clean and clear. It's just not sassy. Which is fair. The appellate court has a, less of a sense of humor. The appellate court is not always here for the for the sass. But maybe they are. She explained that she had begged Mr. Depp's security guards who carried his keys to not let... The, wasn't chat... Am I... This has been like six months on. Chat. Um, <clears throat> didn't the staircase incident happen the same day? Wasn't that all the 21st? Was that a different day? I I, I do not remember if the staircases were a different day when the sister was there. Hoke said, so this is all to establish that the Waldman details are wrong. Yes. But this is a ridiculous waste of space. Yes. It seeks to reiterate the facts of the case. Yes. I don't think it seeks to reiterate the the facts of the case to the appeals court. I think it seeks to continue to bolster Amber's perspective of the facts in the media. That's what I think this section is for. Um, different day. Thank you all. I did not remember. Different day, different day, different day, different day, different day. All right. Thank you all. Um, that was two weeks after Australia. I know we need a visual timeline. I need to just make one. Staircase was prior. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chat is bay. I need a sound. We need a sound for chat is bay. It needs its own little. It needs like a funkier sound. Like chat is bay. Thanks, chat. Let's keep reading. Oh, let's see. Um, so I think, I do think a lot of this, yes, they're trying to say, look, look, the details of the Waldman statement are false. Ergo, knowledge of its falsity. Ergo, we've proven that these um, are with actual malice. They knew it was false. But I also think this is another way to reiterate their perspective of the story in the media. Look, this is the real story again and again and again. But it's well written. Rottenborn, we know Rottenborn tells a better story than Elaine does. It's linear. We appreciate that. We we appreciate that. Um, as a result, she could not sleep. Oh, what is this? Heard obtain a protective order. 
against up at the end of May so that she could change the locks on their home and, and invite people over to hang out. She needed company. She explained that she begged Mr. Depp's security guards who carried his keys to not let him back in their home when he was intoxicated, but they always let Mr. Depp in anyway. It's a problem when it's the property he owns. As a result, she could not sleep and would often wake up with panic attacks. Hurd's counsel notified Depp's counsel of her intent to seek a protective order, but Depp did not appear in court on the day she obtained the order. That fact is in controversy still. Ever since Ms. Hurd obtained a protective order and filed for divorce, Mr. Depp has done everything in his power to destroy her reputation, career, and life. Uh, just for the sake of argument, though, she got her largest roles after this. So... Mr. Depp's intent to retaliate against Miss Heard. So they're saying, look, I understand why they're putting this in. This serves two purposes. One, the PR purpose that we know they want to serve. So it serves the PR purpose, but it also serves the purpose of reiterating some of the um, more, more horrific details of this trial to the public. Um, so. Um, sorry, I just got text messages that I needed to look at. Apologies. I need to pull up my calendar too, because I do have a hard stop today and I need to figure out when that is. And I forgot. So apologies. Um, thrilling content. I know. So I think it does serve the two purposes because you're getting the restatement of the story for the public and you're getting the arguable, Hey, this is how we know that it is with malice. I mean, whether y'all agree or not is for y'all, but that's what they're arguing. Um, let me see. I'm trying. Oh, good. I have till noon. We've got some time. We've got some time. We've got some time. Let's continue. Depp's intent to retaliate against Ms. Heard. They really wanted to be able to say this again in public. They really wanted to remind the public of this. Depp has deep anger and resentment towards Ms. Heard. I think that is a fact. I think that is a fact. I think there is anger and resentment towards Ms. Heard. Um, I think there's also a lot of sadness. I think we saw that in this trial. I, I do think that. Uh, which is relevant to this appeal because it demonstrates he was highly motivated to hire Mr. Waldman to defame her. I get that that's what they need to do. During their, their really, I here's where I appreciate it though. I appreciate that Rottenborn is like, I'm not telling you this just to smear Johnny Depp in the public and to try to say, um, to try to say that, you know, all this horrible shit that he said again and again and again. I'm not just trying to do that. I mean, yes, but no, there's a purpose. Here's the purpose. Um, the purpose is he, he wanted Waldman to defame her because he was so fucking pissed. During their relationship, when Mr. Depp became angry with Ms. Hurd, he expressed his desire to kill her. For example, in June 2013, he sent a text message to one of his friends stating uh, this thing against Amber that I don't even know if I can say on YouTube. In response, his friend proposed a drowning test. Look, man, I know he wants it to be literal. And, and it's, look, no one wants their private text messages when they're angry to become public. No one ever. Um, but when we saw these at trial, I think a lot of people went, I understand the Monty Python shtick. I understand the Monty Python shtick. I understand expressing anger in that way. I understand the Monty Python shtick. Um, but look, y'all don't text your friends that you're going to goodbye or else somebody. Just don't. Just don't. Just don't. Because if it ever comes up, people are going to try to make what might not be literal, literal. Because in a court of law, things are going to be used against you in the light least favorable to you by the other side. So while, while you read those and you're like, fucking hell. I think when Hurd's team failed with these text messages is they used text messages that were clearly not literal so much um, that it lost its weight. And so I think the jury was just like, I mean, okay, he's pissed, but I don't think it's literal. And I don't think the jury thought this was literal. I just don't. I don't think y'all think this is literal. I don't. I don't think any of you think, oh, these are these are actual threats of harm. I don't think any of you think that. Um, so. 
Um, and then it goes on with let's drown her before we do this and the burnt corpse and the making sure she's dead. Y'all can read it. Y'all have seen it. Y'all saw it in the trial. Monty Python would like to be, yes, many. Monty Python would like to be excluded from the chat. Sorry. Can you read that again? Did I read that right? Rottenborn had a really good time reading these. I just don't know if they were as impactful. And if they had stuck to a few of the most horrific texts, it might have retained the shock value. But once they went text after text after text after text after text, you're like, oh, this is the way he talks. And then he got up on the stand and was like, I'm kind of horrified seeing my text messages. It's gross. I'm not proud of it. And I think the jury went, mm, okay. I mean, not ideal, but I get it. Um, Bulldog Mom said they're really gross jokes, though. Agreed. I think they overplayed their hand on these. And I think when they overplayed their hand on it, the jury went, okay, that's how we talk. Tamar said those texts really stuck with me. And I think they stuck with a lot of people. Um, so uh, I think Rottenborn, when he made Rottenborn repeat it, he did. And I think that um, trying to make some of these literal didn't. But I think that there is an argument there to be made. Look, if this is what he's willing to say about about someone he loves to his friends. Of course he's saying these things to Amber as well. Look at the disgusting things he said to her. Look at the disgusting things they said to each other. And look at the disgusting things he's saying to his friend. But they tried to make it so literal that I think they lost the point. I think there was a way to do this without overstating it. And I think they overstated it and it lost its power. After Ms. Hurd obtained a protective order and filed for divorce, Depp announced his plans to retaliate against her. In June 2016, Depp sent a text message to his sister who works in the entertainment industry stating, I want her replaced in that WB film, referencing Hurd's role in Aquaman. I mean, a sentiment the internet seems to agree with. In August 2016, Depp described Hurd in a text message to her former assistant that stated, I'm disgusted, disgusted that I ever f fucking touched that scum. Um, back on Tuesday and then court... Johnny Depp uses the amount of exclamation points I use. We'll hit you when I get back, doll. Come over for a spot of purple and we'll fix her flabby ass nice and good. Ell Ellipses in original. Shortly before he met Mr. Waldman, Mr. Depp expressed his hope that Miss Heard would die and stated that he would stop at nothing to globally humiliate her in a text message to his entertainment agent, which stated, she's begging for total global humiliation. She's going to get it. I'm going to need your texts about San Francisco, brother. I'm even sorry to ask, but she sucked. Oh, the Elon Musk stuff. Yeah, we're definitely going to read these. YouTube, YouTube. I think YouTube currently hates Elon Musk, so these will probably be allowed. Um, She sucked Mollusk's crooked dick. Well, the theme this week is people's dick and balls, and uh, we're just not getting away from other people's dicks and balls. We're just not. We just, we just, we just aren't. We just aren't. It started on, it started on Tuesday, and now we're here. Started from the bottom. All right. Sorry, we're at Elon Musk crooked dick. Um, and he gave her some shitty lawyers. <laughs> those aren't these shitty lawyers. Those are other shitty lawyers. To be fair, I don't think Rottenborn is a shitty lawyer. Um. He gave her some shitty lawyers. I have no mercy, no fear, not one ounce of emotion or what I thought was love for this gold digging, low level, dime a dozen, mushy, pointless, dangling, overused, flappy fish market. I'm so fucking happy she wants to go to fight this out. She will hit the wall hard. Again, I don't think that was a threat of harm. Truly. Um, and I cannot wait to have this waste of a cum guzzler out of my life. I met a fucking sublime little Russian here, which made me realize the time I blew on that 50 cent stripper. I wouldn't touch her with a goddamn glove. Um, do you think he means like a literal glove for your hand or do you think he means a condom? Chat, what do you think? What kind of glove do you think he means? Just curious. Just curious. Um, let's see. Hmm. Renee said, these are from 2013, not 2016. Um, I don't think he says that the, the he le Rottenborn conspicuously leaves the text date off of these. He says, 
shortly before he met Waldman, which means you would have to know when he met Waldman, um, met, not retained, retained Waldman in 2016. So he's, he's um, not precisely misstating the time, but it is put in with these were 2016. We want to assume that these are in the same timeline, but it doesn't say that they're in the same timeline. It doesn't say they're not. It says shortly before he met Mr. Waldman, which means we need to remember what year he meets Waldman. And that's not in 2016 when he retained Waldman. They met before that. So this is this is lawyering. This is lawyering. This is not exactly misstating it to the courts to the court. Um but is it vague enough to be misleading that one would go, oh, that must have also been in 2016? Maybe. Maybe. Y'all are saying actual glove. So. Um, <laughs> Angelique said a glove that fits his scissors. Yes, it's a it's a very special glove. It's a very special glove. Um, so that's lawyering. I think it's a, I think it's sidestepping a little bit. Um, so <laughs> Oak said, wow, wasn't expecting what kind of glove do you think he means? <laughs> Look, man, I think it's fair to ask. In um, in, in light of the context. Uh, so. Let's see. Um, are we done with the venting? Um, I won't. I wouldn't touch her with a goddamn glove. I can only hope that karma kicks in and takes the gift of breath from her. Sorry, man, but now I will stop at nothing. Let's see if Mollusk has a pair. So now Johnny Depp is just coming for Elon Musk. Um, come see me face to face. I'll show him things he's never seen before. Like the other side of his dick when I slice it off. And if you reattach it, then you have Harvey Weinstein's dick. Apparently, we learned that on Tuesday. Unfortunately, the the uh, the first time I read this was when we were going through the UK case. This has now been seen way too many times. Let's move on. And but this was put in to remind, I think, the public. Look, look, remember all the shitty shit he shit the shitty shit he said. Mr. Depp and Mr. Waldman's relationship. Depp retained Waldman in October 2016 again. Vague with the time. Vague with the time. And he continues to represent him. I don't know if we know that for sure. I think that's, I think that was vague on the record. But the appellate court can go to the record at this and see if, see if they agree. He serves as Mr. Depp's primary counsel for all of his affairs. He has assisted Depp with filing several lawsuits, including actions against Depp's former business manager, former attorney, newspaper, and Ms. Heard. Waldman also assists Depp with publicity. In February 2020, Mr. Depp and Waldman met with a publicist who works for the Daily Mail. I don't know why I never considered that the Daily Mail would have a publicist. Like, not just reporters. Okay. I, I suppose they need one just like apparently anyone else. At this meeting or on another occasion? At some point, can we just say at some point, Waldman gave the Daily Mail two audio recordings concerning the case. Waldman has also provided information about this case to several social media personalities who he calls quote unquote internet journalists. Tug has entered the chat, not the literal chat, the, the lawsuit without reference. But, but, but Rottenborn refrains from calling him that umbrella guy. But that's who he's talking about. The Umbrella Man. <laughs> it's disappointing. Put it in a footnote. Put it in a footnote. Link link to the channel. He was present when a journalist for the Rolling Stone interviewed Mr. Depp. By the way, internet journalist. Has anyone changed their handle to internet journalist yet? I, I want to see. <laughs> Can we have that as Elon Musk? Sir, you are in charge of Twitter now. You know how you have like media personality categories on Twitter? Can you put a job category of internet journalist? It would just be funny. Can we do that? I need to tweet at Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Elon Musk. We need we need a category where you can pick your job category and internet journalist is one of them. Yes, Tug and the real Laura B. Yes. 
Irene says, sounds like schizophrenia. That's exactly what Morgan Knight said in trial. Or if you're Elaine, that umbrella God, I think maybe that was worth changing a handle. That umbrella God. He was present when a journalist for the Rolling Stone interviewed Mr. Depp. And according to the journalist, Mr. Waldman reached out to Rolling Stone about writing an article about Mr. Depp. As people who do PR do. After Mr. Depp and Waldman's meeting, the Daily Mail published a series of articles that accurately quoted Mr. Waldman. I like how they just were saying it's accurate. In an article published on April 8th, 2020, the Daily Mail wrote Adam Waldman, Depp's lawyer, said, quote, Amber Heard and her friends in the uh, Amber Heard and her. Amber heard Amber and her friends in the media use fake sexual violence allegations as both a sword and a shield, depending on their needs. They have selected some of her sexual violence hoax facts as a sword, inflicting them on the public and Mr. Depp. The jury found that not to be defamatory. On April 27th, the Daily Mail published the statement, which accurately quoted Waldman as saying, quite simply, this was an ambush, a hoax. They set Mr. Depp up by calling the cops. We've read the defamatory statement a million times. That's the one the jury found to be defamatory. On June 24th, 2020, the Daily Mail published an article accurately quoting Mr. Waldman's assertion that Heard was carrying on an abuse hoax against Johnny. The jury found that not to be defamatory. Each of these articles identified Waldman as Depp's lawyer or attorney. Waldman has generated the content for negative press about Ms. Heard as well. He filed a report with the LAPD claiming Ms. Heard and Ms. Pennington perjured themselves. Then, based on this report, he told a German media outlet that LAPD have now opened up a criminal investigation into perjury of Ms. Heard, which repeated this statement solely curated by him in one of its publications. Okay. Mr. Depp and Mr. Waldman have enjoyed widespread success in generating negative publicity about Amber Heard, yet she was still cast in major motion pictures, and those motion pictures did not receive backlash until later about it. An expert witness who... An Really? This is this is where we're arguing? An expert witness who analyzed negative tweets on Twitter about Ms. Heard found that between April 2020 and January 2021, over 25% of negative tweets about Ms. Heard were associated with the hashtag that included Waldman or a variety of his name. The thing is, and the issue I had with this expert, because I wanted this expert to be good. I was actually very interested in the, the experts being good. This expert said that they were told that every tweet with those hashtags were negative. Every tweet with justice for Johnny Depp was negative as to misheard. So their base assumptions were bad. And garbage in, garbage out. So I've got issues with the expert testimony the appeals court is not going to dig that deeply the appeals court is going to be like la 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 whatever la 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 it doesn't matter where's the rest of the argument that is relevant to this fucking appeal um because because the expert assumed they were all negative i was pissed i was pissed i was so so looking forward to an expert doing experty things and seeing like numbers and science and data. The expert witnessed a the expert witness also detected a huge spike of negative hashtags towards Ms. Heard in February 2020, which coincides with when Mr. Waldman and Mr. Depp met with a publicist for the Daily Mail. I think it also coincided with the leaked audio. And when they assumed that everything that said justice for Johnny Depp was negative, I was out. I was out because justice for Johnny Depp is not inherently negative against Amber Heard. You have to analyze the tweets. You can't just assume, well, they told me those are all negative. Um, Mr. Depp's motion for summary judgment. Oh, we might get to something relevant. Prior to the trial, Mr. Depp moved for summary judgment, arguing as relevant here that Miss Heard could not prove Mr. Waldman published the statement with actual malice. And that the statement was not actionable. See, the thing is, at summary judgment, it's fair for the court to say, let the jury decide. Big fan of justice. It's fair to say, let the jury decide. It's fair to say, let the jury decide actual malice. That's fair. Prove it. 
it's fair at summary judgment to say, no, go ahead and prove it. As a matter of, this is a matter of fact for the jury, not a matter of law. I think that's fair. Heard responded that Depp and Waldman knew the statement was false and that the malice was therefore established. They didn't, I don't think they proved that at trial though. Further, because the statement, but it might not be enough for the appeals court to overturn this. Because the statement accused Ms. Hurd, accused Ms. Hurd of fabricating evidence of domestic violence and then calling law enforcement, the statement was capable of being proven false. Right. She didn't call law enforcement. Agreeing with Ms. Hurd, the circuit court observed that absent exceptional circumstances, the question of actual malice should not be decided at the summary judgment stage. Yeah, it goes to the jury. The court held a reasonable fact finder could conclude that Waldman published the statement with malice because he had no personal knowledge of the underlying events at issue and nevertheless made the statement. Okay. At trial, Mr. Depp moved to strike the conclusion of Ms. Hurd's evidence on her counterclaim. He reiterated the arguments in his motion for summary judgment. He's just a snarky guy. Um... And again, the court's going to say, let the jury decide. He also argued that Mr. Waldman is an independent contractor, not an employee. He's not liable. Depp is not liable for Waldman's defamatory statements in the press. Depp emphasized Waldman's testimony that he is not an employee of Mr. Depp and is not issued a W-2. In light of this testimony, Mr. Depp claimed that Waldman was an independent contractor as a matter of law. And as a result, he cannot be held responsible for any alleged tort by his attorney. What's going to be interesting is this is going to come up more in the Petito case, in the Petito versus laundry matter. They are looping in. Um, they are looping in Stephen Bertolino, the attorney for the uh, laundry family. So it's going to be interesting to see how this argument is made in that case, saying Bertolino's statements um, may or may not be uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress. There are others. And so it'll be interesting to see how this argument starts being made in other cases and courts are going to have to address this. Are attorneys responsible for statements they make in the course of litigation with regard to their client? And this court found, well, this wasn't in the course of litigation. So litigation privilege doesn't apply. Litigation privilege also often applies, but they were saying, no, these are statements to newspapers. This wasn't in the course of litigation. So the, the client should be held liable for what the attorney says. It's, these are interesting questions, legally interesting questions, because truly we're seeing law and lawsuits function in two ways more than we've ever seen before. They're functioning as PR and they are functioning as this is how we're telling our side of the story. This filing is covered by litigation privilege. The things in this filing, I mean, you also need to be ethical and they need to be true to the court, but there's room for zealous advocacy. So you're not going to be sued for defamation for things said in the context of litigation and in the course of litigation. So they, we are going to start seeing these things bump up and we're going to start seeing, well, if you're making a press statement is that part of litigation? Is that not part of litigation? But sometimes that's part of litigation strategy. If your client wins the case and everyone still fucking hates them, do they really win or recover? Maybe not. You might win the case and lose the war. So these questions are going to keep coming up. Um, so I'm interested to see the court take this matter up. In response, Heard observed that Waldman freely admitted to speaking to the press on Mr. Depp's behalf and clarified that Mr. Depp's liability stemmed from Waldman's role as an agent. The circuit court denied the motion to strike, finding the only evidence in this case to this point is that Mr. Waldman was an agent to Mr. Depp. The evidence showed that Waldman had served as Depp's attorney since 2016, and the scope of his legal representation was not limited to litigation. The court noted that cases holding attorneys are independent contractors are distinguishable because they involve attorneys who serve only as litigators for their clients. So what they're arguing is that the, the cases that were cited in Depp's brief are different because Waldman was also acting as like an, a general counsel for all things Depp, was arranging interviews, was doing more than just representing him at litigation. So those cases, the facts of those cases are distinguishable, meaning the court doesn't have to take on the same ruling 
that these cases made. And the court agreed because the court did not take on that ruling. The court further held that the motion to strike is not the proper vehicle for challenging whether a statement is actionable and declined to revisit its previous ruling. With respect to actual malice, the court observed that Waldman made the statement after meeting with his client. Both Waldman and Depp met with the Daily Mail, and Mr. Waldman threw a paper bag containing... Oh, sorry, threw a paper. My brain interjected words that don't exist on this page. Mr. Waldman threw a paper containing the counterclaim statements at Ms. Heard. It's not a good look. No matter how much you're annoyed with Ms. Heard, it's not a good look. With respect to actual malice, the court observed that Mr. Waldman made the statement after meeting with his client. Both Mr. Waldman and Mr. Depp met with the Daily Mail, and Mr. Waldman threw a paper containing the counterclaims at Ms. Heard. But those things didn't all happen in succession. When did this thing happen? It's not clear. And meanness does not mean malice. Malice means knowledge of falsity. And I don't think they proved knowledge of falsity. It might not be enough to overturn the jury verdict. The jury decided that they did. It might not be enough, but I don't see how they did it. Based on this evidence, the jury could infer that Waldman made the statement with malice. Just because he doesn't like Amber Heard is not what malice, that's not what malice means. At the conclusion of the evidence, Depp renewed his motion to strike. The court denied it. That's the thing I'm most interested in in this, really. I'm just, I'm just very, very interested. Um, the refused jury instructions on independent contractors. Depp tendered proposed instructions 22, 23, 24. Regarding independent contractors for the circuit court's consideration at a hearing before the conclusion of evidence on May 20, 2022. Has it been that long? At the hearing, the circuit court rejected Depp's argument that the concept of an independent contractor applies when ruling on separate proposed jury instructions. When raising his sole objection regarding independent contractors to those instructions, Depp stated they, quote, should address the agency issue because you only get to liability on behalf of Mr. Depp if the jury also finds that he is not an independent contractor. The court refused to instruct the jury, explaining an attorney and a client have a principal and agent relationship. There is no evidence of an independent contractor. So the court is saying, as a matter of law, this is an agent agency relationship, not independent contractor. That's, that's why Depp's team is arguing that the court's wrong on that as a matter of law. When the circuit court considered proposed jury instructions 22, 23, 24, Depp did not present additional argument in support of instructing the jury on independent contractors. The court referenced its prior rulings on the subject. At the conclusion of evidence, the court held another hearing on jury instructions where it ruled the instructions, uh, ruled on instructions taken under advisement and additional instructions that Depp had tendered after the previous hearing. Depp did not ask the court to revisit its ruling on the proposed jury instructions 22, 23, 24, nor did he challenge the ruling. Mm, well, Mr. Depp has not relied on evidence presented after the May 20, 2022 hearing on the uh, hearing on brief evidence presented after this date, such as Mr. Depp's testimony on May 25th, the 23rd day of trial should not be considered when determining whether sufficient evidence supported these instructions because the circuit court had no opportunity to consider this evidence. So they didn't raise it again. So you can only consider what's on the record before is what they're saying. When instructing the jury, the circuit court gave instructions that fully and fairly covered the agency issues raised by the evidence. The jury instructions explained the burden of proof on agency, defined the terms principal and agent, and described the scope of an attorney's authority. Argument. <sighs> Mr. Depp's independent contractor theory is an opposite, and whether Mr. Waldman is his agent was a question of fact relating to the assignments of error one and two. Standard of review. A plaintiff who is armed with a jury verdict approved by a trial court stands in the most favorable position known to the law. That argument cuts both ways. And that's the hard thing about defense and, and offense at the same time, because Waldman has to argue defense on this claim, but that argument also applies to, um, 
to Amber Heard's appeal. Sorry, I am I am lip glossing. <laughs> I hear the lip gloss being lip glossy. My light wasn't working on my lip gloss. I was wondering why. Look, lip gloss light, lip gloss light. Um, so sorry if that was loud on the mic. I should have I should have thought about that. Should have thought about that. When a trial court has reviews refuse to strike a plaintiff's evidence, the well-established standard of appellate review requires this court to determine whether the evidence presented at trial taken in the light most favorable to the plaintiff was sufficient to support the jury verdict in favor of the plaintiff. So we lean towards the verdict. We lean towards the jury is right. That's correct. That's a fun sentence, isn't it? Jury verdicts are sacrosanct, your honors. Jury verdicts should be given great deference. Unless they're against our client, in which case, throw them the fuck out, yeet them immediately. Whether the concept of an independent contractor applies to this case is a question of law to be reviewed de novo. Easier standard of review. And whether Waldman was acting as Depp's agent when he made the statement was a question to be resolved by the jury. Waldman can be both an independent contractor and an agent. Mr. Depp claims that Waldman is, as a matter of law, an independent contractor rather than an employee agent. Footnote two. <clears throat> in his assignment of error filed on October 11th, 2022, Mr. Depp asserted that Mr. Waldman is an independent contractor, not an employee agent. In his opening brief, Mr. Depp revised his assignments of error and omitted the italicized language. It is impermissible for an appellant to change the wording of an assignment of error. See White v. Commonwealth. While substantive changes to an assignment of error can result in default, Oh, well, there's the T. Can result in default. An appellate court has discretion to address the merits of an assignment of error where the alliteration appears substantive, but issues pertaining to the appellant's omission, uh, omitted assignments of error are encompassed in the presented assignments of error and are sufficiently briefed. In those cases, the court reverts to the original assignments of error. Your Honor. Here's a footnote. Footnote. They fucked around with the assignments of error. You can. He didn't argue it anywhere else, or at least not yet. We'll see. You can issue a default. You can do it. Yeet. Yeet. Interesting. But again, that's precise lawyering. Look, the language of the assignment of error is changed. They go on to say agency is defined as a fiduciary relationship arising from the manifestation of consent by one person to another that the other shall act on his behalf and subject to his control. And I think Depp's attorneys went a long way to say, look, lawyer's going to lawyer. Who's got control of those lawyers anyway? When an agent commits a tort while acting within the scope of his authority, the principal is liable. I don't think this was well parsed by the jury. We'll see. We'll see um, what the court thinks. Was Waldman acting within the scope of his authority or was Waldman acting as an independent party? An agency relationship can arise in any circumstances and is not limited to the employment conduct uh, context. And this cites a case, Thomas versus Wingold, affirming a jury verdict against a mother arising from a motor vehicle accident caused by her son who was acting as an agent when the accident occurred. What happened? Did, did she ask him to go to the grocery store? Was he delivering things for work? Like what, what happened? What happened to cause that fact scenario? I'm curious. In an employment contact text, a person's status as an independent contractor precludes the existence of an agency relationship. See McDonald versus Hampton. The doctrine of respondeat superior imposes liability on an employer for the negligent act of its employees. If, however, the negligent act were performed by an independent contractor rather than an employee, no master-servant relationship exists between the contractor and employer, footnote three, and the employer is not liable for negligent acts. Right. It's one of the reasons when you hire contractors, you want to make sure they have like insurance and shit, but they're responsible for the things. Footnote three, unlike the employment context, so Ron Bourne is distinguishing, Your Honor, this is not an employment situation. This is different. Question, unlike 
the employment context where an individual's status as an independent contractor precludes the existence of an agency relationship, it is beyond dispute that an attorney and client have an agency relationship. The concept of an independent contractor is an opposite for this reason alone. Does not apply here. Does not apply here. Um, fashionist NY, thank you for the good looking out. I do have a heart out by noon central. So yes, I do, but noon in my time zone. <laughs> so thank you for all my Eastern time zone friends who are like, wait, isn't it noon? Yes. And no. The concept of an independent contractor does not apply in all agency context, nor this is a good argument nor does establishing an individual as an independent contractor defeat the possibility of any agency relationship. Look, he's not, um, Ruximoto says, can't get over the master servant language. Case law that is old uses words. Well, this is case law from 1997, but case law, here's how case law builds. Case law is not going to be in modern language. Case law that is old well, this is not old, but case law relies on older case law. And older case law describes these things in terms of art that we would not generally use in a colloquial way. But these are the legal legal definitions and the appellate courts have not redefined them. So this is what it is. Who's in charge? Um, because employee, employer can be more vague. Will we start seeing the modernization of language across law? I think so. But is it going to take a while? Yes. So law still uses language that you might and we might not colloquially use, um, but it's it's relying on much older principles. So hopefully that helps explain. So they're trying to distinguish the context. Uh, this case says vicarious liability may nevertheless be imposed for the actions of independent contractors where an agency relationship is established. So look, there's more than one way to skin this cat. Hogue Law says, it's beyond dispute that this shouldn't be in the employment bucket. Going to need more than a row of <laughs> a raw footnote assertion there, Rottenborn. Hiring a lawyer sure as heck looks like the hiring relationship. It's a very, very well taken argument. They're trying to distinguish this out of the employment context. I imagine the reply is going to say, well, then what is it? If not employment, because this all started to Hogue's point. This all starts with a statement that Waldman was hired. And that's how we know he's acting as Depp a Depp's agent because he was hired. That's where this begins. Um, Waldman was hired to generate negative press. Retained. This all starts with he was retained. The relationship begins with Depp hired him. So it's a very good point that's going to come up in the reply, but I appreciate the links they're going to try to distinguish it. They're like, Avi, Avi, Avi. Uh, Mr. Depp and Waldman have enjoyed widespread success in generating negative publicity around about Ms. Heard, an expert witness who analyzed negative tweets. Oh, I'm, I'm way far afield. Apologies. Let's go back to where we were. We were beyond footnote three. Um, Mr. Depp is incorrectly importing the concept of an independent contractor, which negates the employer-employee relationship. I don't know if he's incorrectly importing it. A specific kind of agency relationship to all agency contexts. In doing so, he has presented a false dichotomy by arguing Waldman is either an independent contractor or an agent footnote four. <laughs> Rottenborn explains false dichotomy to the general public because the appellate court knows a false dichotomy is a logical fallacy based on the false premise that only two mutually exclusive options are available when, in fact, the opinions are not mutually exclusive or there are more than two options. See false dilemma. Wikipedia. <laughs> Thanks for citing us to, to, to Wiki. <laughs> is, is false dichotomy not well defined elsewhere than Wikipedia? But okay, look. <laughs> He's, it's Wikipedia. I don't know if Wikipedia is allowed to be cited. I don't know. 
<laughs> yes, he really cited Wikipedia. There's got to be false dichotomy has to be defined elsewhere. Hold on. I have questions. I have questions. Give me a second. I have questions. Is false dichotomy not defined by like dictionary.com? Like, could you have not gone to the Merriam Webster's dictionary? Um, maybe it's not as beneficial of a definition. Dictionary.com. False dichotomy. A logical fallacy in which a spectrum of possible options is misrepresented, misrepresented as an either or choice between two mutually exclusive things. What's wrong with that definition? No one cites Wikipedia that's not an authoritative source. Accurate. Accurate. Um, The dictionary is. Wikipedia is crowdsourced, yes. He's trying, he is. I'm a law clerk and would 100% get fired if I cited Wikipedia. I mean, maybe now. We aren't even allowed to cite Wikipedia in school, like not even in high school. You could literally use Wikipedia's source. You could use Wikipedia's source. Yeah, they could go to the base source. You could go to the dictionary. You could go to the dictionary. We just did. A logical fallacy is one. This is is literally 90% of arguments on Twitter, by the way. (laughs) It's false dichotomy arguments. God, I I really enjoyed taking rhetoric and dealing. We need to do, we will do more on rhetoric over on the channel. Um, I really do enjoy looking at the the structure of argument. We have not done a ton of that, but yes. This is not for the court. This is again for the public. I was never allowed to quote Wikipedia. No one no one's allowed to quote Wikipedia. <laughs> Wiki isn't allowed in college essays, but it can be cited in law to the appellate court apparently. <laughs> you all are like we couldn't cite Wikipedia in high school. I mean me neither. It didn't exist, but that's cuz I'm old as fuck. <laughs> Y'all are like, how is this allowed? He can do whatever he can do whatever he wants. I don't look. This is not a serious site. The appellate court doesn't need to have a definition of what a false dichotomy is. They know um, l- lawyers, but the logical fallacy defined by Wikipedia is kind of funny for me. It is. I'm just look. We enjoy the chuckle. It wasn't intentional. I don't think Rottenborn meant to give us all a chuckle, but thanks for it. We're here for it. The two are not mutually exclusive. Waldman can be both an independent contractor and an agent. Even if Waldman is an, oh, the arguendo. Even if Waldman is an independent contractor, it does not preclude Depp's liability for Waldman's defamatory statements to the press. How? As a result, subpart A, the first assignment of error and the second assignment of error do not assert any grounds for reversing the judgment of the circuit court. Wait, you just said it. You just de- you just declared it. But How? Oh, the circuit court properly denied the motions to strike because whether Waldman made the statement while acting as Mr. Depp's agent was a question of fact. In his opening brief, Depp has relied exclusively on his independent contractor theory to challenge whether Mr. It's his strongest argument to challenge whether Mr. Waldman was acting as an agent when he made the statement. He has not asserted Ms. Heard presented insufficient evidence that Waldman was his agent or that he was acting within the scope of his authority. And those arguments are therefore waived. Um, To the extent the court interprets Depp's contention that Mr. Waldman is an independent contractor as a matter of law, as challenging the sufficiency of the evidence on agency, the circuit court correctly denied the motion. So this is another arguendo. This is like, they didn't argue it well. And then they are citing the law on that. Agency may be inferred from the conduct of parties and from the surrounding facts and circumstances. Indeed, because direct evidence of agency is not indispensable and frequently is not available, circumstantial evidence must be relied on. And even though they didn't have a ton of it, such as a relation of the parties to each other and their conduct. A principal's liability does not turn on whether it it directed its agent to take a certain action. Rather, The test of the master's responsibility for the acts of his servants is not whether such act was done in accordance with the instructions of the master to the servant, but whether it was done in the prosecution of the business that the servant was employed to do. So is this a natural, is this a natural result of what Waldman was hired to do? Rottenborn is arguing yes, because Rottenborn's arguing Waldman was hired to trash Amber Heard and file lawsuits and trash Amber Heard and file lawsuits. 
So that's why we get all of the, um, that's why we get all of the argument before, like, look, Waldman was hired to, to, um, meet out this like revenge of Johnny Depp's to damage Heard's reputation. So this is naturally in the scope of that, obviously your honors. An act is regarded as authorized in the legal sense if it is incidental to the performance of the duties entrusted to the servant, even though it is in disobedience of the master's express orders and instructions. So this is from the same Wingold case, 1966, um, applying this test outside the employment context to conclude a mother was liable for the damages arising out of, arising out of a motor vehicle accident caused by her son, notwithstanding that he disobeyed her instructions by driving the vehicle. I told him not to take the car. Can you imagine how pissed you would be? Because the son was performing the very act or class of service he was instructed to do uh, by returning the vehicle to his mother. Don't drive the car. He's like, I'm giving you back the car. So, um, that's their argument, really, is that obviously Depp wanted global humiliation for Heard, hired Waldman at the same time he was making those statements. So obviously Waldman is trying to carry out the global humiliation. That's that's their argument. This is in the scope. Accordingly, Depp's assertion that he is not liable because he was not personally involved in directing or making the statement is incorrect. He entrusted Waldman to be his mouthpiece in continuing to defame Ms. Heard through public statements as part of his campaign of self-described global humiliation. I should have just kept reading. In so doing, Mr. Depp made Mr. Waldman his agent for those purposes. It's a good argument, especially when you know that the appellate court will lean towards supporting a jury verdict. Furthermore, whether Waldman was acting as an agent when he made the statement was an issue of fact for the jury. Either way, Your Honor, this is for the jury. The jury found he was an agent. The evidence established that Depp seeks to retaliate against Ms. Heard for obtaining a protective order against him for filing the divorce. If they had argued this better, they did not argue this well in closing. They could have. They could have argued this much better. They did not argue this well. But anyway, um, the evidence established that Depp seeks to retaliate against Heard for obtaining the protective order. Shortly after announcing that he will stop at nothing to globally humiliate her, Depp retained Waldman, who serves as his primary counsel for all of his affairs. And that's that's the evidence they're relying on, that statement. That statement. Um, so, <laughs> Hogue is like, car ownership liability is not remotely applicable. They're going to argue it. Look, it's it's the argument they've got. It's a fair argument. The reply is going to be like, yeah, but no. <laughs> but I was like, no, no, no. You cannot bring in employment scope of the agency precedent when you've stated it's not an employment context. I know they're arguing against each other. They're trying to say this is not that context, but then also this is that context. But then also the jury was right. Waldman has spoken to the press on Depp's behalf on several occasions. For example, Waldman confirmed that he was accurately quoted by the Daily Mail in the articles published. He did say that. Waldman was identified as Depp's lawyer. But I don't know if people think he's speaking on Depp's behalf, even though he's, it doesn't matter. The jury decided that he was. Mr. Waldman has also provided information about this case to several social media personalities. Internet. And was present when the journalist for Rolling Stone interviewed Mr. Depp. So they're trying to establish that Waldman was acting beyond the capacity of just like litigation counsel. Before the articles in the Daily Mail were published, Depp and Waldman met with the publicist for the Daily Mail. Waldman gave the Daily Mail two audio recordings, but could not recall if he did so at the meeting or another occasion. Waldman generated negative press about Ms. Heard by filing a report to the LAPD. I mean, filing the reports, not the press. That getting out into the press is the press. After filing the report, Waldman generated press about his own accusation by telling a media outlet that the LAPD have now opened a criminal investigation. I mean, he prompted it. In summary, during the course of Waldman's representation, he and Mr. Depp met with the Daily Mail. This is just rehashing what we've already heard. Waldman also provided the two recordings. Dude, I'm not repeating myself. For everybody who's like, Emily, stop repeating yourself. I'm just reading this. It's oh, like over and over again. We could we could have narrowed this down a little bit. This did not need to be rehashed like six different times. 
Um, but Emily, that's what you do. Yes, the hypocrisy is real here. I, I exactly do that. I'm not writing to the appellate court. I'm live streaming. Mr. Waldman also provided the Daily Mail with two audio recordings. Footnote five, that's what we wanted to get to. Well, the concept of an independent contractor is irrelevant in this case, but you've also said he was retained. It's not employment, but it is employment, but it's not employment, but it is employment. Well, the context of independent contractor is irrelevant in this case. The evidence demonstrates that Mr. Waldman is not an independent contractor, Your Honor, but even if it was, he's not. As a matter of law, because a fact finder could have concluded that Depp has the right to control Mr. Waldman's publicity work. On what evidence? Power to control an individual's work is determinative of whether he is an employee or an independent contractor. So now they're arguing, but either way, maybe he's a miscategorized independent contractor. Is that what? Is what is the footnote is, but your honor, maybe, maybe he's a miscategorized independent contractor and he's really an employee. No, he's not maybe an employee ever. For instance, Mr. Depp's presence at the meeting with the publicist for the Daily Mail supports the inference that he had the right to control Mr. Waldman's statements to the Daily Mail. It does not support the inference that he's the fucking employee. Ugh. No. Based on this evidence, the trier of fact could have concluded that the scope of Mr. Waldman's representation involved generating negative publicity about Heard. So he is an employee. So his representation is that he's an employee and it involved negative publicity. He was hired to do that. He's contradicting himself, but okay. Alternatively, a finder of fact could have concluded that Waldman had authority to speak to the press on Mr. Depp's behalf or to generate negative publicity about Ms. Heard without making any finding as to whether doing so was part of his role as an attorney. How? Wait, but How? How? I need to read that again. A finder of fact could have concluded that Waldman had authority to speak to the press on Depp's behalf or to generate negative publicity about Ms. Heard without making any findings as to whether doing so was part of his role as an attorney. It ha There has to be an agency relationship. Where else would the agency relationship come from? In either case, Ms. Heard presented sufficient. Either way, it's fine. In either case, Ms. Heard presented sufficient evidence that Mr. Waldman was acting as an agent. What evidence, though? Uh, he just keeps saying there's sufficient evidence, but not really citing to what the evidence is. Look, Your Honor, there's sufficient evidence, I assure you. What? You've put in a bunch of text messages and one statement by Waldman. One. What other evidence? Like, I, uh, the, the law is well argued. Even if we disagree, he walks through the law part very clearly. The problem is the evidence just isn't on their side in this because Waldman said, I accept that instruction and refuse to answer because attorney client privilege. Waldman answered very few questions. So I don't think there is sufficient evidence. If there's evidence, where is it? Show me where, where it's the one statement. All matters. He hired him to handle multiple matters. The court need not adopt any rule regarding whether attorneys are independent contractors as a matter of law. This court should reject Depp's request to adopt a rule that clients cannot be held liable for their attorney's misconduct because they are independent contractors as a matter of law for several reasons. First, that would suck for us. <laughs> Several courts have held that attorneys are not independent contractors and have imposed liability on defendants for their attorneys. Well, for their attorney's torts. Um, citing this case, holding that defendant can be held liable for its agent's attorney's actions taken within the scope of representation, including possible torts committed by him. Like what torts? What are we talking about? This, these are all in the employment context, by the way. Holding that a client may be vicariously liable for the actions of his attorney so long as the attorney was acting within the scope of employment and in accordance with what is believed to be the client's best interest. Finding the client vicariously liable for attorney's intentional torts 
But then you have to find that it's an intentional tort, and they didn't. They didn't find that. All right. Second, none of these cases Mr. Depp cites involves whether a client can be held liable for his attorney's defamatory statements to the press. Um, I'm pretty sure that hasn't specifically been addressed. And most are distinguishable for additional reasons. I don't think this, they said in their opening brief, this has not really been addressed in Virginia. And I don't think we're seeing that it has been. Applying the Fourth Circuit's test for determining employee status. So now we're back to they. there is an employment relationship. Um, of Title VII and the Age of Discrimination of Employment Act rather than examining vicarious torts for intentional torts. Why are we talking about that? Noting an attorney was retained for the sole purpose of collecting monies upon a judgment when reaching its holding that the attorney was an independent contractor, unlike Mr. Waldman, who was retained for several purposes, including litigation and publicity. See, Your Honor, he wasn't, he was, he was retained for all of this, including the bad publicity. So he is employed for this purpose but not as an independent contractor. He's more like an employee. So they're arguing both this isn't an employment context and this is an employment context. And if it is an employment context, then he's an employee. Okay. <sighs> they're trying to distinguish this case as well, noting a party to a civil suit cannot be liable for the intentional wrongful conduct of his attorney unless the client is implicated in some way other than merely having entrusted his legal representation to the attorney. I don't think that's the case here, which is unlike the facts of this case because Waldman assisted Depp with publicity as well as legal representation. Um, they're really working to distinguish it. Several of the cases cited by Mr. Depp emphasize the that imposing vicarious liability on a client for actions taken during the course of legal representation would lead to negative consequences for the legal system, including making parties reluctant to file suit or giving ill-equipped parties the ultimate responsibility over their legal representation and encouraging clients to micromanage their attorneys. It's a fair argument. Like, can you imagine the circumstance if a client who was fully paid by Tom Girardi was sued by a client who wasn't paid by Tom Girardi? saying, hey, client that was paid, you should have made your attorney pay me because their tort was theft from me. So you're responsible for what your attorney did because in getting you paid, I didn't get paid. I could see this slippery slope of attorney clients being liable for attorney conduct. Rottenborn would say that that's distinguishable, but... They say the concerns are minimal here where Waldman spoke as Depp's agent to the press outside the bounds of traditional legal relationship. So is it or is it not a relationship? And Mr. Waldman's assistant with publicity only tangently, tangentially involved litigation. Is it? So if Waldman's speaking was outside the bounds of a traditional legal relationship, is he not acting? Is he not acting as a as an agent then? <laughs> Last, clients generally rely on their attorney's professional skill and judgment with respect to intricacies of the legal field. Yes. In such cases, clients have little ability to monitor whether an attorney's conduct is tortious. Yes. Because they lack legal knowledge. Yes. Whether an attorney speaks on his client behalf to the press, no legal skills when, sorry, when an attorney speaks to, speaks on his client's behalf to the press, no legal skills or judgment are involved. I don't agree. What you can and cannot say takes legal skill and judgment. And consequently, holding a client liable for his attorney's defamatory statement is warranted. Accordingly, this court can assume without deciding. <laughs> Your honors, just assume. It's fine. Just go ahead. You want to. They can assume without deciding 
that attorneys are independent contractors and hold that a plaintiff may nevertheless prove a client is liable for the acts of his attorney where those acts are not part of the attorney's legal representation in litigation or do not otherwise involve an attorney's professional skill and judgment. I would say whenever an attorney speaks about ongoing litigation, it probably requires some professional skill and judgment. <sighs> Ms. Heard presented sufficient evidence of actual malice. Tell me where Mr. Depp waived any argument that summary judgment should have been granted. Why? Hold on. My nose. My nose. In the section of his opening brief regarding actual malice, Mr. Depp asserts the circuit court erred in denying Mr. Depp's motion for summary judgment and motion to strike. Despite this statement, he has presented no argument concerning the summary judgment record and relies exclusively on evidence presented at trial. The conclusion of this section suggests Mr. Depp seeks to abandon any error regarding summary judgment by omitting any reference to this motion and stating only that the motion to strike should have been granted. Um, section 5A requires the opening brief to include argument. So they're saying he didn't include enough argument. You've waived the argument. Arguendo. Here we go. In any event, the circuit court properly denied summary judgment. Um, in reviewing a ruling on a motion for summary judgment, the court views the record in the light most favorable to the non-moving party. We know in Mr. Depp's memorandum supporting his motion for summary judgment, his sole basis for arguing Ms. Heard could not prove actual malice was an interrogatory response described as factually empty. According to Mr. Depp, this interrogatory requested that Ms. Heard explain, quote, how Mr. Depp can be held legally responsible for Waldman's conduct. Ms. Heard had no burden to develop the record at summary judgment. Granting summary judgment based on discovery. Yes, we know. Hold on. Where's your argument? Rather, Mr. Depp, as the moving party, has the burden of proving no material fact was genuinely in dispute. As such, any deficiency in Heard's interrogatory response was a discovery matter. Okay, fair. Okay, fair. Uh, standard of review. Ordinarily, when reviewing a circuit court's ruling on a motion to strike, the court determines whether the evidence presented at trial, taken in light most favorable to the prevailing, prevailing party, was sufficient to support the jury's verdict. Because Ms. Heard is a public figure, she was required to prove the statement was made with actual malice. Knowledge that it was false or reckless disregard to whether it was false, not meanness. Whether the evidence in the record in a defamation case is sufficient to support a finding of actual malice is a question of law. Good. They're saying not a question for fact, question of law. Is there sufficient evidence? Tell me what evidence there is. Tell me. Appellate courts have a constitutional duty to exercise independent judgment and determine whether the record establishes actual malice with convincing clarity. I'm still confused. This rule of independent review assigns to judges a constitutional responsibility that cannot be delegated to a trier of fact. Taken together, these standards of review require the court to view the evidence in light most favorable to Ms. Heard when examining the record for evidence of actual malice. Ms. Heard could prove defamation by showing either Mr. Depp or Mr. Waldman had actual malice. I just, I think the court will take this point up. It needs to be clear. Who's malice? I, I really do want to know. Because I don't think this gets you there in an agency relationship that you take on the malice of the underlying party. What they're trying, here's, here's what I, I just, we're just talking, we need to talk it out for a minute. We need to talk it out for a minute. Let's sidebar. Let's talk it out. Here's what they're trying to argue. Look, Depp is responsible for what Waldman said as if Depp said it because Waldman is an agent. So Depp is Waldman. But if Depp is Waldman, then doesn't Depp take on Waldman's state of mind and not vice versa? If Waldman takes on Depp's state of mind, how do you prove that? I think if you're saying Depp is responsible for what Waldman did, that the law says you take on Waldman's state of mind because you're taking on like what this person did I'm responsible for. So all of this person, not either or. Adam Waldman 100% believed what he said was true. Right. 
So this is why I think the court might take up this question. It's an interesting question, but the trial court did seem to allow the jury to decide one or the other. And that is a problem when you allow them to decide one or the other. <clears throat> there are three distinct bases on which the common law of agency attributes the legal consequence of one person's action to another. Actual authority, apparent authority, respondeat superior, or statement third of agency. A principal is subject to direct liability for an agent's tortious conduct that occurs within the scope of his actual authority, while vicarious liability arises from respondeat superior or a tort committed with apparent authority. Well, we're in the second one. Contrary to Mr. Depp's contention, Ms. Hurd did not rely exclusively on a theory of vicarious liability. There is no actual authority. You didn't prove... You didn't prove actual authority. How would you have proved actual authority? You. Uh. Okay. Heard did not rely exclusively on a theory of vicarious liability by maintaining that Waldman made the statement while acting as an agent. This is because the principal's liability for the acts of an agent is not confined to theories of vicarious liability. How, tell me more. Ms. Heard was free to argue liability arose for whatever fucking reason. I'm sorry, that's not what it says. Because Mr. Waldman was acting within the scope of his authority when he made the statement. So are you arguing actual authority? Because that's vicarious liability. Indeed, she tendered in the circuit court gave a jury instruction titled Express and Implied Authority, which provided an attorney has the express authority to do everything which the client expressly authorized him to do. But you didn't prove that. There is no proof that there was ever express authority. Johnny Depp said he hadn't seen the statements, hadn't heard about the statements, didn't ask anybody to make the statements. That it's And there was no contrary evidence to that. That's why they argue implied and implied authority because that's the only theory you get here on but okay but okay <sighs> i i need to zoom zoom so we can still get to questions the jury instruction said an attorney has the express authority to do everything which the client expressly authorized him to do there's no evidence of that and the implied authority to do everything necessary or incidental to the purpose for which he was retained. That's the world that we're living in on these facts. As previously explained, a finder of fact could have concluded for the purposes of which Mr. Waldman was retained included speaking to the press on Mr. Depp's behalf or generating negative publicity. They're trying to make fetch happen by saying, look, there is express authority. He was hired to trash Amber Heard. Hired to do that. The principal's liability for acts of an agent is not contingent upon the agent's liability. For example, a principal is subject to liability to a third party harm by an agent's conduct when the agent's conduct is within the scope of the agent's actual authority. They're really trying to make this an actual authority argument. I don't think that's supported by the evidence. Um, the agent's conduct is tortious and the jury found that it was defamatory. The agent's conduct, if that of the principal would subject the principal to tort liability. But I don't think we're at actual authority. They're, I'm going to just state it again. They're, what they are arguing is that Waldman was hired to damage Amber Heard, not to be the lawyer to damage Amber Heard. So everything he did is the is what he was hired to do, hired to do. So he's not an independent contractor. He's kind of an employee and he's an agent because he was hired to do this thing. Even though they were trying to say this isn't the employment context, they say he was acting within the scope of his, his authority because that's what he was hired to do. That's what they're arguing, which contradicts what they said earlier. But they're trying to argue now 
that this isn't that this is firmly within the context of employment and this is within the scope of his employment that's why this is so confusing they've argued two completely different things in this so where it was clear it is no longer clear i was like at the beginning i'm like eh, this is well laid out now i'm like what in the ever living fuck i've lost i've lost my generosity um so now they're arguing this is squarely within what he was hired to do to trash her <sighs> this is not well parsed at this point we have now gotten in and they haven't even said arguendo this is like this is outside the employment context disregard all those cases in the employment context however in the employment context he was hired to fucking do this oh I need to read this again. I'm gonna, we're going to have to cover this again because the first look is not helping me parse it, which is not great if you're the appellate court. You really want the court to be able to go like, oh, I see your argument. Because at the beginning, I'm like, oh, I see your argument. And then we got here and I'm like, wait, you're contradicting yourself. You're trying to distinguish the case law and then you're contradicting yourself and the case law you're trying to distinguish, which is really frustrating. All right. One of the reasons a principal's liability can be independent of an agent's liability is an agent's action may not be tortious because the agent lacks information known to the principal. Otherwise, a principal could hire an agent to make false statements to avoid liability for defamation so long as the agent lacked actual malice when publishing the statements. I mean, I guess that's their argument. They're trying to take this from the third restatement of agency saying, look, then anyone could do this. Then anyone could hire someone. But now we're back into the employment context. As 704 makes clear, Ms. Hurd could prove defamation by showing either Depp or Waldman had actual malice. Waldman's conduct is tortious and imputed to Depp if he published the statement with actual malice. He has to publish the statement with actual malice. And they're saying, but... The actual malice can be Depp's actual malice, not Waldman's actual malice. Ms. Hurd, um, let me back up. Mr. Waldman's conduct is tortious and imputed to Mr. Depp if the published statement, if the statement is published with actual malice. The inquiry is whether liability for defamation would arise if Mr. Depp published the statement, thereby permitting Hurd to rely on Depp's actual malice to prove defamation. Here, evidence established that both Mr. Depp and Waldman had actual malice. How? Mr. Depp had actual malice. Well, he was there, so he would have known if it was true or false. That's what they're saying. He was there. He knows that Ms. Hurd and her friends did not spill wine or rough up the penthouses because he caused the property damage to the penthouses and spilled the wine. Waldman had malice. Waldman testified he had no firsthand knowledge of whether Ms. Mr. Depp abused Ms. Hurd, but claimed he saw some things that show her statements to be false. When describing those things with respect to May 21st, he testified. So there were two police officers, one domestic violence trained female police officer who testified over and over and over that there was no damage to the penthouse, which Ms. Hurd claimed, which Ms. Hurd claimed was destroyed. That's a direct quote, destroyed. So he's claiming that he was relying on the police officer's statement. Okay. Based on this testimony, a fact finder could have concluded that Waldman believed that there was no damage to the penthouses on May 21st, 2016. This conclusion would have been supported by the testimony of three law enforcement officers who responded to calls to investigate domestic violence at the penthouses. All three officers saw no damage to the penthouses. And the jury could have inferred that Waldman spoke to these officers or reviewed their testimony when reaching his conclusion that there was no damage to the penthouses at any point in the evening of May 26th, May 21st. Yet Waldman told the Daily Mail that there was damage to the penthouses. He asserted, quote, Amber and her friends spilled a little wine and roughed up the place. So he's saying it's literally false and he knew it was literally false because the officers said there was no damage. So now we're conceding that there was no damage and that the officer's testimony was correct. Okay. So Wald, they're saying Waldman, no. They're saying that the jury could, could find 
that the statement was literally false because Waldman would have known that there was no damage to the penthouse and he said it was roughed up. The jury could have found that Waldman's testimony contradicted his belief in the truth of the statement, thereby demonstrating that he knew it was false or was reckless with respect to its falsity because the officer saw no damage and no spilled wine. In addition, when making the statement other uh, and others as Mr. Depp's attack dog. Oh, wait. I read that awkwardly. Um, Tracy in the chat says, wait, didn't Amber Heard testify the place was trashed? Yes. And they said they put pictures. They put pictures in it. They put, they put in pictures. So. Um, roughed up doesn't mean damaged. It could mean messy. I agree. Their argument contradicts a lot of things. Yes, it does. Uh, this is like trying to diagram a sentence accurate, which I'm terrible at. <laughs> so, so uh, when making the statement and others as Mr. Depp's attack dog, and when he filed a police report for perjury simply so he could tell the press falsely that Ms. Heard was being investigated for perjury, Mr. Waldman selectively credited only the evidence he believed was favorable to Mr. Depp and ignored the abundant evidence of Mr. Depp's abuse of Ms. Heard. What abundant evidence? Including the evidence regarding the night of May 21st. You, you didn't show that Waldman knew. Waldman said he didn't know. Ignored abundant evidence of Depp's abuse. Waldman testified he didn't have abundant evidence. And he didn't say he filed a, fully, a police report so he could tell the press. He said he filed a police report because he thought she was a fucking liar. I'm summarizing. He thought she perjured herself. That's why he filed the police report. I think it's a reach to say he filed the police report to tell the press. He told the press after he filed the police report because he believes she's a liar. But okay, this is splitting hairs. But the underlying question that is very interesting to me is, can an attorney be held vicariously liable for the statements of their attorney? Because I don't think we get to express liability that this is what he was hired for, though they are making and going a long way to make the argument, and they should have just stuck with that one. They should have just stuck with it, but they can't because he's an agent, not an employee. And so they're trying to argue both ways, and I don't know if that's going to help. A jury could have reasonably concluded that he either knew his statement was false or was reckless in knowing it was false. The statement is actionable because it contains provably false factual connotation. And I think that's why the jury found in this that they found for her with that. Because I said, no, the timing is wrong on this. Whether an alleged defamatory statement is one of fact or opinion is a question of law. And they're arguing that all of Amber Heard's statements are statements of opinion, even though the court found that as a matter of law, they were not statements of opinion and they could go forward. So this cuts both ways because they're arguing differently in the other motion. In conducting its review, the court does not determine whether the alleged defamatory statement is true or false, but whether it's capable of being proved true or false. The statement is not protected speech. So they're saying it's not an opinion. Fine. Here's the statement again. Uh, it can it contains a provably false connotation that they didn't call back the police and rough the place up and talk to a publicist. Like there are parts of this that they're like, no, these parts are false. The contention that Miss Heard carried out an ambush or hoax is is falsifiable because Miss Heard can and did prove Mr. Depp abused her. I don't know if that's how the jury came to that conclusion. I think the jury came to the conclusion because the jury the jury did not find the other statements of hoax to be defamatory. I think the jury found that the roughed the place up, spilled a little wine, and called back the officers were the problem, but they're going to state it the way they're going to state it. I think it is the fabricating evidence part that they didn't believe the timing. this, I think this is the more powerful argument 
The assertions in the statement are capable of being proven false with evidence that Ms. Hurd and her friends did not call law enforcement on May 21st, 2020, 2016. They did, though. Io called the police. They did not spill wine. The police said they didn't see wine. Rough up the couple's home. The police said they didn't see it roughed up at all. Fabricate evidence of domestic violence or contact a lawyer or a publicist. They did contact a lawyer, just not a publicist. Um, so they're going with abuse and hoax, but the jury didn't find those to be persuasive. I think it was the other stuff. Mr. Depp does not challenge that the statements contain a provably false factual connotation. Instead, he maintains that the context of the statement transforms it into an opinion. I think this is their weakest argument. I think the strongest argument is that there's no actual malice. When determining whether a statement is actionable, courts examine the statement in the context in context by applying a general rule that words are to be taken in their plain and natural meaning and to be understood by courts and juries as other people would understand them and according to the sense in which they appear to have been used. Context in context. Depp contends that a reader would understand the statements as Mr. Waldman speaking as a legal advocate and offering his own interpretation of disputed evidence. And that's the argument for letting in the other statements he's responding to. In Riley, the First Circuit observed that even a provably false statement is not actionable if it is plain that the speaker is expressing a subjective view. Um, how many more pages do we have? We're on page 40. We have a lot more to go. Um, we have like 10 more pages to go. Y'all, we might not finish today. Chat. Can we put up a poll, Mingalina? Should we finish this tomorrow and look at the amicus briefs tomorrow? Because we are not going to finish. Well, we put up a poll. Let's see if we should just do that. Sorry, mods. Let me look at my calendar for tomorrow. What's my calendar for tomorrow? Um, I have a meeting. I could do it after my meeting. I have like a one hour meeting at 11. I could do a little bit of a later stream tomorrow. Maybe we just need to do it. Um, Wendy, everyone's on slow mode because we have, you know, 14,000 people here. All right, let's put up a poll. We might have to do this tomorrow or we might have to finish this tomorrow. Because I do want to get to the rest of this. Um, I cannot finish this today. I have a whole bunch of stuff to do today. Sadly. But I could finish it tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I could finish it tomorrow. All right. We'll put up a poll. The other poll. Do we need a deeper dive into TikTok? Yes, 80%. All right. More TikTok content. Let's put up a poll about tomorrow. I'm on page 40. Um, I'm going to look at a few questions before I have to go. Y'all, we are just not going to finish this today. Yes, with Ben's response to the amicus, yes. I should have quick bitted quick bitter. I should have quick bitted quicklier. <laughs> but we're going to have to do a part two tomorrow. Question, why is Rottenborn the only lawyer on the response brief? Can Amber Heard only afford ballot spar for just her appeal? Um, I don't know why that choice is made. I don't know if it would cost her more. I imagine it would to have ballot spar responding to both. It could be because her insurance company is paying only for her appeal and not her response to his appeal. I don't know. It could be, it could just be a choice. Look, Rottenborn argues the law well. He His theory is not as clear as I hoped it would be in this um, because we waffled back and forth about employment context, non-employment context. So could we also talk about the other response from Ben Shu tomorrow? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. I I would rather hear Ben's response. I mean, we can do both tomorrow. Who is paying him in the insurance lawsuits? Who's paying who in the insurance lawsuits? We're not sure. Um, Regarding the amicus, we really just need Ben Chu's response. The actual briefs are mind-numbing. I mean, I will preview them tonight if we're going to cover them tomorrow to do kind of a Zoom Zoom. So I'm going to go through a few Super Chats. Um, need an EDB eyeglass brand slapped on that mic. <laughs> We might need some branding on the mic. I haven't done that yet. We just, you know, I might, I might get one that is a, a bit more colorful. So got my Law Nerd hoodie and I love Cursey Words shirt. Love them. I'm so glad Colleen over at the Law Nerd shop. They are super comfortable. I've got my, um, I've got my Law Nerd pink heart hoodie on today. These are embroidered. They are so comfortable. They are so comfortable. So comfortable. Bet Heard bought an established title to move. I, I bet she is trying to claim citizenship um, in Scotland. I'm being facetious. 
Megan said, I feel your hyperfixation. I have horrible ADHD and can't get anything done without my meds. This shortage is killing me. I'm sorry, Megan. Um, hopefully you're able to work with your medical professionals to find um, an alternative. The med shortage is a huge problem. Cheshire Grin said, applied for first job in 20 years. Fingers crossed. We are all crossing them. Anita said, I worked in jewelry and would love to give you some insight on those infamous earrings. If you're interested, I can spill some tea. Anita, my email is public. Please email me. I would love to hear what your thoughts are. When we talk about the Erica Girardi earrings, a lot of you pointed out that the metal type is different, 14 karat versus 18 karat. The sizing is substantially different. And um, there's a lot of speculation about whether or not the first pair of earrings, the stolen earrings, are actually the ones that were turned over and a larger pair were the replacements. So, um, let's see, we're going to get to a few more super chats if we can popping in to say hi, uh, was pulled to assist another department at work. And now I have a long list in, uh, in's like claim to mitigate. Well, thank you for being here. We're happy. Good luck at work. Worked on a case where a guy killed his wife and kid and argued he was a victim too because he lost his family at sentencing. Daniel, that would have been infuriating to sit through. Um, much, much more infuriating than sitting through, I lost my stocks. Question, isn't Northwest nine years old but on TikTok? Yes, it seems to be a parent-managed account, but yes. Um... Paige, this was a great question. So why can we charge teens as adults? Always wondered. It depends on the jurisdiction, the law, and the crime. Um, and that's that is truly changing the way that teens are tried and sentenced as adults. Um, there's a it's rare in LA these days, but there's a whole process for it. There's lots of findings that are done for it, and it tends to be used with teens who are very close to 18 years old. Whether we change the legal definition of adult ever, I don't think we will, but there is a lot of science that your brain is definitely not done developing even at 18. But there are some crimes where they're like, did they know the consequences of it? Um, and that though teens make bad decisions, there are some things like intentional homicide that you knew you know are a problem and you know that they are illegal. So they tend to be used for the most severe um, of violent crimes. But it really does depend on jurisdiction. Um, the Chugi show said Brittany Griner is on her way home. I saw news of that. I haven't read a ton of it because I got up and started streaming. Um, Texas Caddy said TikTok is allegedly reporting to the Chinese government. That's what the lawsuit's alleging. Amanda Eleven said, I'm a teacher and I took a sick day, so I'm finally able to watch or be here live. Hello. Sometimes I rewatch when I'm stressed because your demeanor makes me feel like it'll all be okay. It will be okay. We're here together. I mean, even when things suck, it, we'll, we'll figure it out. We're here together. Emily at work on the Rewind crew. I mean, we're still live. <laughs> and my question is on TikTok. Why are you leaving the app on your device? Are you leaving the app on your device? I go back and forth on that all the time and I haven't decided. I'm, I'm, I go back and forth on that all the time. I'm tempted to get a second device for TikTok. Julie asks, are you a full-time YouTuber? Yes. I mean, and podcast host and other things, but yes, I'm a full-time content creator. Doesn't the officer's testimony combined with Amber's testimony pictures suggest the penthouse was rubbed up after they saw it? Waldman would have been or would have just been wrong about calling the police again. I think the jury, well, the jury, we've got to assume the jury found something to be wrong in there and the jury found the timing to be wrong. But yes, I think there is, there is room to, um, there is room to for sure argue and they might that they did rough up the place after they just didn't call the, the, the police back. Cause the police showed up after the, the, or before the place they saw before they saw any damage to the place. So yes, I think there's room to argue that in the reply. Sorry. That was a really inelegant, inelegant way of stating that. Cause I am zoom zooming. Um, let's see. Elizabeth said, Emily, love your channel. Thank you. Home convalescing after spending five days in the hospital. Feel better. Everything I've read said Depp met Waldman in October 2016. See, and then they're implying that some of those texts took place in that time. Um, Miguelina, why don't we go ahead and end the poll about tomorrow? And if we do mods, if we do pick a time for tomorrow, I will put it in our in our chat um, after my meeting. 
Can you use opposing counsel's response arguments against them in an appeal? Like, could Amber Heard's team be arguing the jury decided be thrown back at them? It probably will be. Um, because, but they are separate appeals. But it will be. I would I would take kind of their languaging and use it in the other one. Just to be. Just to be smarty. Hi, Emily. I recall real uh, Laura B. debunked this meeting as untrue in her vid on this brief. I will have to take a look. I don't recall it from the testimony, but I have not gone back and looked at the testimony. But that's what the reply is for. Um, Melissa said this segment sponsored by Manscaped. I mean, I should. <laughs> I should have asked Manscaped before the show. Hey, we're talking about balls a lot this week. Want to sponsor a stream in addition to the podcast? Court was definitely send it all to the jury. I've practiced before that judge. She had no civil experience before becoming a judge. Gets confused in civil cases and throws it all to the jury. She definitely threw a lot to the jury. Um... Oh, Laura B. Check Twitter DM for Depp opposition. I will. We'll we'll do that tomorrow. Rosalind, thank you for your insight. My son is in the Navy. I received a letter telling me to delete the app from my phone because the app tracks your text messages and IP addresses associated with the location. Yeah. Let's see. Um, should we finish this tomorrow? Yes, 85%. All right, you guys. I've got to go because I do have a meeting that I can't miss and I am late. I appreciate you. Thank you for being here and thank you for being a lawner. Tomorrow we will do no quick bits. We will just do a part two. We will cover this and we will cover the Amicus response. I will let you know what time later today. If you do not follow me on the socials, follow me on the socials or over in our members only community. I will put up a poll or I will put up a place for the members to ask questions so I can make sure I get to those tomorrow and address them as we were, as we address this. Um, and you can give me more feedback and information. Y'all, if you have feedback and information on this, put it in the comments and I'll try to address some of it tomorrow as well. So lawnardsunite.com at the Emily D. Baker all over the place. And I will see you tomorrow. I will put that up later today. So keep your notifications on. Mods, thank you so much. I've got a jam. All right, let's, we're going to roll the outro real quick and I'm going to scoot scoot. Connect with me everywhere. I'm at the Emily D. Baker. If you guys want to join the text, just text emily.com. If you want to join the channel, lawnerdsunite.com. Happy to have you support what we do here on the YouTube.